the dynamics in inflation, in supply and demand globally have shifted. The Fed's going to be higher for longer, probably for a lot longer than people think. We got to the higher rates. What's next? Which stocks are going to succeed, which are going to waver through this new environment? The upward movement in the 10-year note is reflecting a new fair value, which I don't think markets have fully discounted yet. You have to wait for the dice to stop dropping. And the problem is that everybody's been trying to catch them. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramos, and Tom Keen on radio, on television. What you need to know, we need to fold the data check right into our discussion this morning. The markets, plural, are on the move. There's no other way to put it. Lisa, just one icon from the northern and Pacific Rim, the Japanese yen through 150 is historic. And we'll get there in terms of what this means for policy, but I take your point. It's not just the yen. It's that bond yeah. deals are continuing to go up. You're still seeing softness, even in areas where you're seeing companies outperform. When do we reach a tipping point? We're not there yet. And that, right. to me, was the takeaway. Smartest paragraph I saw today. He will join us later on Bloomberg Surveillance. Julian Emanuel working with Edward S. Hyman over at Evercore ISI. And it's real simple. He says the Fed can't be happy. And you see that with the unraveling of two-cent spread, the real yield going out above 2.52%. The market maybe is doing the work for them, but it is not yeah. easy. And it's not clear that it's actually doing the work that's needed. Because what we're going to get today is a GDP figure that shows a reacceleration in in growth that is not what the Fed wants to see. Yesterday, we saw a blowout number of new home sales. This is momentum that the Fed isn't necessarily counting on to help drive down inflation. Bramo getting me up to speed because I'm <laughs> drowning in the narratives. Greifeld knows all the narratives. Catherine Greifeld joining us uh, this morning. Katie, I haven't even looked at this. Bramo brings it up because she's way ahead of me. GDP, first look, 4.5%. It's a slow economy. We're really yeah. struggling. Really reaccelerating That's on the GDP front. Yeah. We also have initial jobless claims, which you talk about awkward for oh, the yeah, Fed. That could just add to it. So, yeah. I mean, there's the economic data, but the, the character of 4.5%, to me, it's two Americas. And they've got, they're affected by the data. I haven't even looked at the 30-year mortgage. I'll do that while you're talking, Lisa. But the answer here <laughs> Can't wait. is we're moving. Yeah, I mean, this is true. This, the market has moved in the last 24 hours. And from what I can tell, nobody's talking about it. Well, and the feeling is at this point, when do we stop? And this was the discussion yesterday. It feels like a falling knife because everyone, t someone tries to step in and say, OK, I like duration here. I like uh, tech wow. stocks here, et cetera. You're looking at a scenario where the yield just keeps going up and stocks just keep feeling weakness. Greifeld house shopping, 8.09%. Are you kidding me? Round it up, 8.1%. No, do do no housing? one is happy with that. Sellers aren't happy, buyers aren't not happy. happy. You can't move. I mean, and the Fed's not happy as well. We're dearth There's no speakers today? <laughs> no, do we well, have an auction? Actually, to be completely honest, there is a speaker, but it's not about Fed policy, so it doesn't count as Fed speak. I'm just going to okay, put that aside. It's the quiet okay. period. Words will way. be spoken. Words will be spoken, yeah. but they will be spoken quietly and not having to do with monetary <laughs> what policy. What we need to do is get through the brief because we've got a wonderful guest to synthesize these markets for you with really more than years of experience in the zaniness right now. I'm just going to look at the data. Futures are ugly. Negative 28. The VIX way over 20. Gets out to 21.42, and that's up a full stick. That gets my attention. 495 on the 10-year uh, yield. Oil quiescent, $89 a barrel in dollar. I don't have the time now to go into it. All you got to know is DXY, BBDXY, they blow through to new blended highs. And the yen, uh, an historic statistic, a wow number when you were looking. It's strong yen through 100 to 99, 98. Yen, 150.28. With a multi-market brief, Lisa Abramowitz. <laughs> oh, yeah, and people are looking for intervention over there. We haven't even mentioned this. 8.15 a.m., we get the ECB rate decision. Oh, yeah. Followed by 8.45 a.m. press conference by Christine Lagarde. To me, I'm less interested in what they do with rates. The expectation is for them to be on hold at 4%. Much more interested in the balance sheet. This, to me, is the secret story underpinning some of the moves that we've seen in the bond market. All of the central banks around the world <clears throat> are not buyers. They are sellers. And this is a shift. Two things going on here. Alberto Gallo to join us later as well. If I'm Lagarde, I'm looking at the thermometer of the system over there, and that's a difference in yield between Italy and Germany. And you can do this when AC Milan plays a soccer game that was suspect. You uh -huh. know, you can do this. I'm missing Pharaoh. I'm channeling AC it's Milan great. with him it's here. But the relevant. answer is Italy higher yield against Germany shows the tensions in Europe as well. And the difficulty of the ECB to really address it at 8.30 a.m. in the U.S. It's a story of strength. We get 
uh, third quarter GDP, the 4. first look 5%. at it. 4.5%, yes, terrible. but Bloomberg Economics expected to come out at 4.9%. <clears throat> We're also getting initial jobless claims. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen to join our own Peggy Collins in D.C. from 1.30 to 2.15 yeah. p.m., so don't miss that. And today, we haven't even talked about this. After the bell, we get Amazon and Intel earnings. Amazon may be giving us the cleanest read on how much they are capturing some of the cloud spend, whether this means that Google is pairing away. What I find the most interesting is after year-to-date gains like this, up 44% for Amazon, right. people are looking for a reason to sell. And the NASDAQ had the worst day yesterday, going right. back to February. Why? Maybe because people are just looking for opportunities oh, to trim more Oh, come on, Google, negative 10%. Katie Greifeld, Amazon, are they going to do a Google today? We'll see. They'd like to do a Microsoft, probably, but uh, Alphabet, worst day since March Alphabet, 16th, 2020 Google. yesterday. You think about Katrina, how that feeds Google, into sense. It's not Alphabet. It's good. Just You've so learned. You know. Just keep talking. It's yeah, the yeah. Way Katrina Dudley joins <laughs> us right now. She calls it Google, not Alphabet. She's with, well, she's really with Mutual share Series, Mutual Shares, which goes back a zillion years, but she is with John Templeton's Franklin Templeton as well. How do you manage money right now? Um, you manage money as though things are what you the data is telling you. And we keep talking about the fact that there's a recession coming, but every data point you've just given me is positive. GDP is at, in the fours. I mean, for me, that is just a positive data point. The jobless claims continue to come out, and they're continuing to be positive and surprising you. So we're all focusing on the negatives. Companies are all cautious, and they're being almost being told, don't be the optimist in the room. And as an investor, that's when you make money, is that when your opinion and what you're seeing is different than what consensus is. So where do you is. make money right now? I mean, what's great about this, and of course the heritage of Franklin Templeton, is, is the basic idea of you've got to choose. Recently, active management's been a challenge, but where is the opportunity given the correlated market I see this morning? So I would look at our portfolio and say it's actually the most balanced portfolio in mutual global discovery that I have seen since I've been managing it. Mm -hmm. And so we just have opportunities that exist across the markets. And you know, the, be the benefits from us of being a global manager is I can go shopping in any market. So I can go shopping in Japan and pick up really good quality franchises there. And so that's the, that's what we're looking at is where there's, you know, there's dislocations in the market and where you've got a U.S. stock that trades at a, you know, a premium to a, you know, a good European or a good Japanese company. And so they're the opportunities that we're finding as active managers. But for once in my career, we're not seeing all the opportunities crowded into one sector. We're actually seeing them really dispersed. How much can you really bank on a corporate model at a time where you have unhinged bond yields and a real uncertainty about what's behind that, given the fact that there are central banks selling, given the fact that there are shifting buyer bases around the world. You know, it's interesting that, yes, I talk, we talk about the central bank selling, but actually the consumer is buying yield. It's the first time that they can look at their money market accounts, and they're making 5% on their money market accounts. They're able to go into the treasury markets and make real yields. So I think that that's where some of the money is going to come from. Um, in terms of looking at those yields thing, you've got to think about it. What are the implications from a company-by-company perspective? Um, basis. And actually, we've been talking for over 20, 30 years how low yields have kept all these uneconomic businesses in business. And so the rising bond yields potentially flushes out some of these companies. And what does that do for the remaining companies? It actually makes them you know, better and they can gain market share. So it's a good thing, some of these rising bond yields. So let's get a little bit more specific. Yesterday, uh, Meta came out. They had better than expected earnings. Mm -hmm. It was a good report. And then on the call, they said, we are very subject to volatility in the macro landscape, the revenue outlook is uncertain for 2024, and the shares tanked. People were looking for reasons to sell. Are you coming in and buying? You know, everyone is looking for reasons to sell everything. If you look at the regional banks, a similar type of commentary happened. If there was any type of negative quarter, you know, commentary on the fourth quarter NIM, the stocks all tanked as well. So you're exactly right. Everyone keeps looking for these negative data points. But if you stand back and if you were objective and didn't put labels on this, and I was to give you some of that data in terms of what we're seeing on the job market in particular, you would be bullish. I mean, people are employed. Um, you know, companies are still struggling to find labor. So even though someone like Ameta, you know, has gone through layoffs in the past, probably a little overstaffed and just taking that down to normal. And those comments, though, do make put fear into the market that we don't think is 
supported by the real action of companies. Well, let's talk about that fear because the pushback there would be, okay, you have a still robust, a still hot labor market in particular, but you think about what that could mean for the Fed in that last leg to get inflation back to 2%, that they're going to have to tip the economy into a recession to do that. So how are you thinking about that risk and balancing against your portfolio? I don't think that they need to tip their economy into recession in order for you to get the inflation number down. I think that the first thing we need to recognize is that inflation is really a backward-looking measure, and the Fed has forward-looking models as to where they think the market is going. And so I think that the comments that they're coming out and talking about higher for longer um, is really informative. They are also not talking about rate cuts, and we are not expecting rate cuts to come. So in terms of the, the narrative, the Fed is not looking to tip the market into a recession. I think that is the bad case outcome in this situation. I think that they're just trying to make sure the economy's got enough support to kind of get through this and mm. to muddle along. And Katrina, you said that you could go anywhere right now. You could go to Japan. Are you? Are you going international? Yes. We have increased our weighting in Japan significantly. I think that if you are on the ground in Japan, the, the, the essence of what's <clears throat> happening is tangible. You've got the reforms coming out of the stock exchange. We're talking about you know, really simple metrics like price to book, uh -huh. but it's also followed up by a lot of other things in terms of you know, in, you know, in, you know, having those dialogues with shareholders that these Japanese companies haven't been doing for so many years, um, improving their returns on equity, um, improving you know, their balance sheet structure, getting rid of those cross holdings, um, buying back stock in the market. So Japanese companies are actually doing what we like to see them, you know, what mm. we like to see a good um, company do. And I think that's what makes us really optimistic. The cheap valuations, low ROEs, and the, and the really good mindset yeah. change. Katrina Dudley, Bond University, Australia, one of the greatest lights in investment in Australia. I was stunned. I said, Katrina's here. She's not remote from Washington. And then I look at the list last night at the White House. Katrina Dudley was stood up by the president. Rick Springfield was stood up by the president. The damn Veronicas of Brisbane were stood up by the president. Were you stunned you didn't get an invite to the state dinner last night for the Australian uh, royalty? You know what? I have been here for 25 plus years, so my Australian accent may be strong, but I think you know I align so much right. more with Americans and, and, and with my residency status yeah. now. How close with the tensions in the South Pacific and the South China? To see how close does Australia and the United States need to be? Australia and the United States have a long history of partnership, and I do not think Australia is willing to back down from that. The two countries are just so alike in the way that they operate and the way that they see the benefit of capitalism and they, the way that they value entrepreneurial spirit, and I think that extends into... With what Rick Springfield did on General Hospital, how... I mean, Justin Wolfers got an invite. <laughs> he and Betsy were there, but Rick Springfield was stood up for the Australian State Dinner. I was crushed. I was sitting there tracking it all. He was going to go with Jesse. We'll leave it I'm, at did you have a... Um, no one has a clue what I'm talking about. Fashion, fashion reviews. I was expecting the Tom Keen fashion no, I, no, reviews I'd let the Veronica's, the I'd let the Veronica's take care of the fashion review. <laughs> I'd have well. to buy you an Akuba for the uh, for the next time yeah, you're on, uh, on there. At gunpoint, I was forced to read all of Neville's shoot. Katrina Dudley of Australia, thank you so much with Franklin Mutual uh, series today. The steak dinners are amazing. You look at the guest list. Thanks to CNN for lining them all up. It's so damn political. Oh, I it's mean, so it's political. Just I was actually looking at the list. I do want to bring this to you just quickly, not to shift gears too much, but UPS shares came out. And I do want to talk about this a little bit more yeah. later on because they're falling toward a three-year low after a revising lower their outlook. I'm so glad you brought Talking this about package delivery numbers coming down. This is a bellwether type of stock for the average I, I, I can't say enough how much I agree with you on FDX and, and UPS. This is really tangible about the American economy, really coast to coast as well. On the markets, in the 7 o'clock hour, as I mentioned earlier, he's focused on the Fed and these markets in turmoil. Julian Emanuel of Evercore ISI. Stay with us. Bloomberg Surveillance. so grateful and so humbled to have gotten a unanimous vote on the floor by all of my colleagues here. We're going to dispense with all the usual ceremonies and celebrations that traditionally follow a new speakership because we have no time for either one. The American people's business is too urgent in this moment. The hour is late. The crisis is great. In America, we hear you. 
America, we hear you. The gentleman from Louisiana there in the shock of Washington, D.C., getting through one, two, maybe three, I can't, I've lost count, four, to get to a House speaker that will carry on the tradition, say, of Sam Rayburn and others. Of course, Mike Johnson, he is of Louisiana, constitutional law. There's been an uproar in the last number of hours over some of his track record. Lisa, uh, you know, you, you look at the zeitgeist that's out there, and progressives, of course, as you'd expect, are bent out of shape. But what I find interesting is the middle ground seems to be bent out of shape. Well, the middle ground feels uh, pretty beaten up after this whole back and forth. And there's a question, did Matt Gates just win, right? And they felt like some of the things were underhanded. Yeah, but here's put. the question now. Mike Johnson has to really rule as a consensus builder. Can he herd cats right. more than put forward his particular point? Of view. And Katie, the immediacy of the deficit, you know, you see where the bond market is, folks. And I'm not, you know, we don't have time right now to go into this, but I got a 495 10 year, I've cut back out to a 508 30 year bond. Let's be blunt, the bid walks away from bonds, and you wonder if it's about the debt and the deficit. Well, listening to Mike Johnson speak yesterday, I mean, it was clear that he has priorities coming into this speaker chair. And he did talk about the need to form a bipartisan uh, committee to address the debt. Of course, I have to imagine on his priority list, that falls below Ukraine to, or aid to Israel and Ukraine. We'll see if Ukraine, you talked about border security as well. And of course, that looming potential shutdown. Yeah. Maybe in the rotundas where the senators and the new Speaker of the House uh, meet, we'll have to see on that with direct experience on that is John Lieber. He's managing director of Eurasia Group's United States uh, shop. Is Ian Bremer extremely busy looking at the Eastern uh, Mediterranean. John, let's fold in both stories right now. Mike Johnson has to lead a fractious house over to the Senate, where you were with the senator from Kentucky. Great. We've got to pass some form of war funding for a set of wars, maybe a set of border debates as well. Can Johnson, can Speaker Johnson get it done? He could get it done. I mean, if uh, Speaker Johnson wanted to put the bill that's probably going to pass the Senate on the floor tomorrow, it would almost certainly, or, you know, when the bill passes the Senate, it would almost certainly pass the House. Um, so it's not a question of if he could, it's a question of if he wants to. And Johnson is, you know, he's a guy of the right. He's not a Freedom Caucus member, but he's aligned with a lot of their views. I kind of think of him as Jim Jordan without all the personal baggage that prevented Jordan from becoming the speaker. And a lot of conservatives in D.C. are happy this morning because they see uh, Johnson as picking up the mantle of Jordan and moving with that. What that probably means is, He's going to try to extend current government funding into next year, uh, meaning that this November 17th shutdown threat is probably muted, uh, uh, reduced today relative to what it was yesterday. And in next year, he's going to try to leverage another government shutdown to try to cut more government spending. For foreign policy on Ukraine, Israel, a border wall, funding for Taiwan defense, uh, these issues are not popular on the right. And even though they have massive, overwhelming support, bipartisan support in the House and the Senate, I'm not convinced yet Johnson wants to put that on the table. And I could see him trying to leverage that stuff for spending cuts on the overall appropriation side, which is ultimately where I think this is probably going. When he, you would talk about cuts, he actually has been vocal about cutting Social Security, about of, of cutting actually Medicare and some of these other entitlement programs. How much can he actually get that ball, ball going? I mean, do you expect that to be very much on the table? No, not at all. There's no chance Congress is going to cut Social Security or Medicare. There's no, there's, there's maybe five or six lawmakers that would actually vote for a plan like that. Um, if it were that, uh, if, uh, for a plan to be meaningful, uh, there's there's very few lawmakers who would actually support that, and it's just not on the table right now. What the fight's going to be over is over these 12 appro appropriations bills and the FY24 funding. Johnson's already laid out a plan to cut FY24 funding and then start the FY25 budget cycle uh, in order to give Republicans, and he argues, to give Republicans some momentum going into the 24 elections. And this is not about expanding spending, despite the fact that there's, you know, multiple uh, potential global conflicts that are brewing right now that the U.S. couldn't get involved in. This is about cutting spending. And earlier, uh, Tom, you mentioned the bond, the, the, the issues in the Treasury markets. I mean, I, I think that in some ways, these Republicans are a little bit ahead of the curve because they're here talking about cutting spending at a time the rest of Washington is well, talking about expanding spending for all these foreign policy priorities. But politically, they just 
are in a minority for now. Well, but John, uh, taking a step back, there are different ways to cut spending. And right now, there's a real question about the immediate threats to different U.S. troops around the world, uh, not only in the Middle East, uh, in Israel, but elsewhere in the Middle East. How concerned are you that the U.S. cannot come through on its obligations if it cannot get a financing bill passed through Congress and that it looks less likely at this point? I think ultimately they will pass Ukraine aid. I think ultimately they will pass Israel aid. Israel aid in particular is overwhelmingly popular in both parties, and Ukraine aid probably hitches a ride and travels along with that. That's in the plan in the Senate. That's where I think this probably ends up going. It's going to be a lot less than the $106 billion that President Biden asked for, however, um, because of this resistance in the House. And uh, the, the, the other issue is the timing. Does this come, you know, the first obvious inflection point where they can get this done is on November 17th with the government shutdown date. If Johnson decides, nope, he can't go there, it's not good for his conference to do that, he may delay this and leverage this out, as I mentioned earlier. And John, I want to talk a little bit about Johnson himself, because even Steve Scalise yesterday was joking about people needing to Google Mike Johnson after he won the speakership. And that relative unknownness to the American people, potentially to some of his peers, when you think about the process of building consensus here, what shot does Mike Johnson have? Uh, yeah, I mean, this is all. This whole thing is a reminder of what an inside game this whole speaker's race has been. And there's been all this speculation and a couple of more famous members who have popped up. And then this really obscure guy gets through because he's kind of the last person standing at the bar and he's acceptable enough to enough members who have been chastened by the multiple rounds of votes that have become a little embarrassing. And I think that's how uh, Mike Johnson uh, slid through. In the 90s, this is basically how Denny Haster slipped through to become speaker uh, when... Uh, uh, the, the former speaker was taken down in a in a scandal, and you know so this is not the first time we've seen an obscure member rise yeah. to the to the forefront. John, thank you for the brief, really timely. John Lieber of Eurasia Group there on Washington, and again this with the markets moving. I'm going to do a complete data check here in a moment. Lisa, just a round robin here: equities, bonds, currencies, commodities. What is your peak attention this morning? Well, I'm looking actually at the yen, ironically enough, and I'm also looking at actually the incentive to sell in the tech space. To me, this is the most interesting thing because earnings have actually been pretty good, and the fact that Meta beat earnings yeah. came out and said we don't know what's going to happen. Well, you know, no kidding, who does? Yeah. And all of a sudden, psh, the hey, shares just tank. We're Bitcoin free today. What do you see <laughs> in the market that has your attention besides BitDog? I want to keep talking about tech because coming into this week, I mean, the hope was that you'd see these big tech companies come out and reset the narrative. Some did. Some did, but not enough to look. If you look at the price action, I mean, what you saw in Alphabet yesterday was just overwhelming. Maybe Amazon will mm -hmm. be the savior here, but there's a lot resting right. on that company right now. It's going to be interesting to see, to say the least. And of course, this goes into earnings. Bloomberg Technology will brief you uh, this afternoon and on to uh, Romain Bostic and what we see uh, this afternoon. Uh, you know, I want, I want to look at the data now. Lisa's looking at 150.29 yen. This is a Japanese yen with weakness back to in the vicinity of. 1986, the 10-year yield in Japan, I rarely use this word, is a moonshot to a higher uh, yield. The Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index shows restriction right now, negative 0.23. Chairman Powell's got to make note of that. Dollar stronger across the complex. Lagarde considers a 105 euro, maybe on its way to 104. Sterling, Farrell can't get a, he's got a, he's got an umbrella in his cocktail and he's getting killed. And so he's paid in Sterling, did you know? Yeah. <laughs> Every day he comes on. Yeah, it's like four to one was where he was. Right now, Sterling, we're looking at a 120. Do we break 129? Futures at negative 20. Dow futures at negative 80. The VIX up a stick. Tension in the market, 21.21. Bloomberg Surveillance, good morning. Bloomberg Surveillance, good morning. Catherine Greifeld in for Jonathan Farrow, an extensive sabbatical for Mr. Farrow. I spoke to him yesterday. Yeah? Yeah, it's great. Do you know on his cruise, you can look out the port window, and in the, he has a cabin, I've never seen this, that goes all the way through to the starboard side. Is that so? It's so very He cool. can avoid seeing anyone on his way to the And he gym. said it's a little disconcerting. <laughs> he says, you know, it's like it hasn't been rough seas, but he says mm -hmm. that you can look out both windows is not constructive. Yeah, I is mean, that like the penthouse of the ship? How it's does not the trip? penthouse. It's like two levels below that, but he's like 16 okay. decks up. He says the deck is no fun. He went out on the deck once and he said... 
you know, it's just, it's just too much. Anyways, Pharaoh's scheduled to return Monday, uh, maybe Tuesday as well. He'd want a data check right now. Let's do that. The VIX up a stick, 21.21. Uh, Some real tension there moving from the 1819 level over the last 48 hours. And you see this critically through the market. We've been trying to correlate this for you. Oil not playing $89 a barrel. You'd think it'd be 93, 94 now. No. But the dollar's stronger, and there's any number of ways to go here, Lisa. I mean, I, I'm going to take out dollar, euro, yen, 158.48. Tells me it's really not a euro, yen story. It's a dollar, yen story at the 150.27. Right now, the macro stories are saying we haven't hit the tipping points in some of the trends that we have seen. What I'm looking at is for the micro trends, which is why I was really hinging on UPS. And I want to just take a look Please. quickly at that. Revenue fell almost 13% to below expectations. The shares are low. Uh, by two and a half percent. But Katie, the shares were already lower by 15 percent year to date. We're looking at a company that sees revenues declining from lower package numbers. This is going to be a real question. Is this macro or is this specific execution? Yeah, that's the thing. And it feels like UPS can't <clears throat> catch a break. And you also remember this is a labor story as well. Of course, they signed that new contract with the Teamsters. It's front loaded uh, in this well, first year. That's going to hit profit margins as well. I looked at me Metis like Metis something down at the bottom of the income statement, they're making 34 cents in the dollar. UPS is like a real business. They're making under 10 cents a dollar. They're modeling out nine, nine cents a dollar. Their profit is one third or one quarter of Facebook. I mean, it's a different world than the tech babble Katie Greifeld talks about every day. <laughs> well said. Uh, not about the tech babble, but in general, I you are well seeing said. that. You know, that is fantastic. I will it's do tech babble, too, but everything yeah. Katie says, anyway, Katie says, uh, is more than babble. All right, under surveillance, we'll talk more Please. about UPS in a bit. Morgan Stanley selecting Ted Pick Please. to succeed uh, James Gorman as CEO for the bank. Pick, a 30-year veteran of the firm, is credited with turning around the bank's yeah. trading business after the 2008 eight financial crisis and Gorman he is stepping down after a 14 year uh, run leading the bank but he'll stay on as executive chair you know, I just look at this and I go what is in the oxygen up route 7 in Vermont Thomas showed owns a high ground and small bank I knew you were going to Ted pick Middlebury grad takes the trophy at Morgan Stanley what is it about Middlebury other than they gave me six stitches in my elbow I mean I don't you know <laughs> he's holding a grudge they don't get it. it's a grudge <laughs> Ted it's a grudge I say what else do you have well hold on a second okay. just quickly I will say it's going to be interesting because there's a lot of tit for tat in Goldman Sachs, and this has been one person credited with giving Morgan Stanley yeah. the upper, upper uh, hand. And we got to talk to Shanali yeah. about like there were other people in the Derby, like. And they're staying on, which is somewhat yeah. unusual when you look at these big bank succession stories. But Andy Saperstein, Dan Simkowitz, they're all staying with Morgan Stanley, which is a testament to this process. We are the world. <laughs> they're Blumreich. all singing Kumbaya at Morgan <laughs> Stanley today. Blumreich right. and Ali Vasek is going to be sitting down with Gorman and Pick at 10.30 a.m. Eastern. Do not miss this. They will sit and sing Kumbaya together. Uh, the UAW and Ford putting the finishing touches on a new labor deal that would end a strike that's gone on for nearly six weeks. Ford offering to restore cost of living allowances and pay increases over the near five-year term of the contract. They are expected to reach or exceed the union's 30 percent target, according to reporting by Bloomberg. Why are you shaking your head? I'm so glad you brought this up, because like, if you wake up at Chrysler today, you're like, OK, what do we do? What's the, what's the, I, I don't understand the first mover status for Dearborn. Yeah. I, I just don't get, okay, what's the so what now for the other two companies? Well, it was interesting looking at the UAW's top Ford negotiator. He says that he, the UAW told Ford workers to go back to work to put pressure on the other two. So we'll see when that materializes and maybe some deals. Although you pointed out about UPS and some of these deals that the companies are coming to, how much does that shrink margins? And where are going to be some of the shrink points? We heard that a bit from GM earlier this week. Meanwhile, the ECB rate decision just under two hours away. Central banks set to keep rates on hold for the first time in over a year. There are growing signs their run of hikes is working to bring down inflation. <coughs> Economists in our survey unanimous in predicting a hold. The team at Bloomberg Economics adding that the ECB will, quote, probably try to communicate that its main policy rates will remain on hold through the first half yeah. of next year. It's a really good team in Europe that, that we put together. Anna Wong and Tom Orlick has put that together as well. It, as I said, I think the other day, Lagarde at Marrakesh was adamant to get back to a 2 percent statement. But I, I just really wonder, with the tea leaves you and I see, you know, it's like 12 noon when we see them there. 
and they still indicate inflation. I mean, there's just no other way to put it. There's none of this David Rosenberg disinflation chat going on. Which is the reason why I wonder, yes, they might not raise rates further, Katie, but what you might end up seeing is a balance sheet kind of emphasis. And that's why I'm really focused on that, considering all of the pressure on who's buying the bonds. Yeah, and we were talking about this yesterday, this divergence coming between some of the big central banks, the Fed's balance sheet versus the ECB. You consider the fact that they're still staying fully reinvesting uh, those mature securities through 2024. That is a long time. Normally, with Jane Foley of Rabobank, we would talk about the hedging business across this world, the actual use of foreign exchange in business. Or on this day, we would talk about the European Central Bank. We do a surveillance rip up the script with Ms. Foley today, head of FX strategy at Rabobank, and look at Japan. First principles, uh, Jane, the yen is weakness back to 1986-ish. What does that mean for Japan and the people of Japan? Well, oddly enough, it probably means something a little bit different this year than it meant last year, because last year you had uh, commodities across the board really rising, and of course uh, the yen was really emphasizing that. And of course, as we know, Japan doesn't have its own natural resources. These are all imported in. So that was a really significant problem, particularly for the, the medium and the smaller size businesses who couldn't export out, who weren't benefiting uh, from the, the weakness of the yen in that direction. Now, this year you still have you know, fairly elevated doll prices, but some of those commodity prices, you know, have slipped. So potentially uh, the yen is meaning something different to some firms, but it is right. still a problem. You see this in, in some of the Tankan reports, etc. For small and uh, businesses, medium-sized businesses, yen weakness is, is still an issue. So the question is, you know, to, to what degree is this pressure going to come through onto the Bank of Japan? Do they right. see that the yen weakness now, you know, enough for them to alter policy next week? If we move away from the, the, the babble, the foreign exchange babble of Michael Rosenberg or the uh, academic Academics of Ken Rogoff and Maurice Obsfeld move on to the hardcore truth. Japan needs to buy U.S. bills, notes, and bonds. How does a 150 yen change the appetite of Japan to buy our paper and keep the bid up? Or, you know, if we do see uh, yields going higher in, in Japan, if we do have a tweak to yield curve control, we've seen speculation over the last week or so suggesting that the Bank of Japan may be prepared to allow that 10-year yield to rise. How does that alter the dynamic then for domestic Japanese investors, you know, looking at U.S. Treasuries? Now, that, that clearly is a concern uh, potentially for uh, the, the U.S. Treasury at a time when they, they see potentially less buying uh, from Chinese investors too, and at a time when, you know, supply is, is, is going to be a, a constraint perhaps through November with the refunding. So, you know, the, the, there's various different elements to, to this outlook. And, um, you know, that is why I think next week's uh, Bank of Japan uh, meeting is going to be so important for lots of different reasons. Are they going to announce another tweak to yield curve control or not? One of the interesting things about Japan is it's been so out of sync with the other global central banks that are actually reducing their balance sheets and aggressively moving in the opposite direction. I want to talk about the ECB and the announcement that we're going to get in about an hour and a half time. How much are you expecting them to talk about the balance sheet and how quickly that can continue unwinding at a time where people are talking about unmoored long end rates? This is, I think, going to be really fascinating, not just today, but really going into 2024. And it, and it raises, I think, particular questions, again, about Italy and Italy's debt. We saw a month or so ago uh, that the right-wing government say that they can't meet uh, the, the pledges that they did have for, uh, for lowering the budget deficit this year and, and next year, that they want to uh, give uh, that their voters uh, the welfare payments that they voted for. Uh, now, next year, we could run into some constraints, really, with, with Brussels and, and Italy. We're going to see some new... Uh, revised uh, 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 targets, really, or ideals uh, from Brussels where, as to where Eurozone budgets and, and deficits should be. And so this all comes into the environment, you know, for, for, for the ECB and, and its programs. Uh, if we do run into issues between Italy and, and Brussels, to what extent will the ECB be willing to use its tools or, 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 or not? Because, it, you know, the ECB uh, could see, we've seen some reports of this over the last week, suggesting that uh, sources are suggesting that, that, that if Italy's uh, uh, debt yields sort of come into trouble, well, that's because of the, 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 the politics of, 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 of the budget in and, and Italy and, and, and not really the problem of the ECB. So I think all of these questions are going to be highly topical as we move further into 2024. 
Well, Jane, when you think about that delicate dance that the ECB has to do, keeping an eye on all of these different nations, and you think about rate cut expectations being pushed out for the ECB to the second half and then some of next year, is that realistic? Well, given that the ECB has a, a target just on inflation, well, that's probably what they're going to focus on first and, and foremost. So, I, I think we, you know, we have seen core inflation come down in the eurozone. We've, we've seen the PMIs earlier this week suggest that the the labour market is, is loosening. They are positive signs, but all the same, inflation is above target, and, and therefore, uh, I think one of the communication aims for today will certainly be to try and stop the market from pricing in interest rate cuts too soon. So we've got this sort of European high for longer thing, I think, going on. If we do run into difficulties, say, with Italian debt during the course of 2024, uh, if, if Italy growth you know, does, does slow significantly, um, you know, that's going to be a, 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 a potentially a, an issue for, for the central bank. But I think for now, the signaling is going to be about trying to control the inflation outlook, trying to promote this uh, higher for longer, do not price in interest rate cuts too soon rhetoric from, from Lagarde. And let's bring this conversation to the currency market because, of course, that's where a lot of this drama is playing out. You look at Euro USD right now at 105 and change. I see your view is at 102 on a three month view. What gets us there? Well, I think a large part of this is going to be the, the European story. We're forecasting that the Eurozone could be in recession right now in the second half of, of this year. You know, we, we were concerned about uh, at the outlook for Germany. We're concerned about the impact of, of higher energy prices. What's that going to do for, for German industry over the long run? I mean, we, we've got to look at natural gas. It's still not back to, you know, pre-Russian um, uh, uh, invasion of Ukraine sort of levels. This could have a longer term impact. We've got labor uh, market issues in, in, yeah. in Germany too. Uh, that could alter the outlook for, for industry. So significant concerns, I think, about the outlook for, for European growth over the medium right. term, and I think that is going to be an important part of the equation. Our heroes, Jane, Robert Mundell, Rudiger Dornbusch, and others would tell you sequential interventions become ever weaker and weaker. Do you just assume action by BOJ or MOF is a weaker effort this time? Well, they certainly haven't done an awful lot of intervention. I think they they understand the view that as soon as they show their hand, or as soon as they use, you know, some of that ammunition, then it does weaken. Um, so if they can get, you know, as much value for their, their buck just by verbal intervention, that's what they're going to try and, and do, and that's what they really tried to do, I think, this year. Um, however, if we do not see a tweaked to yield curve control next week, um, you know, if we see the Bank of Japan maintaining those very very accommodative monetary policy settings. Um, you know, I, I think there are going to be lots right. of bets um, and lots of speculators pushing a, a dollar yen above that 150 level. Jane, thank you for the brief, particularly there on dollar yen. Jane Foley is with uh, Robo Bank. You see how military they are? You know, the foreign exchange people are ruthless. Everything's about ammunition, and yesterday it was powder dry. I mean, there's Jane Foley from Britain. She's again, she's going back to Cromwell, 1642. She's Japan's keeping their powder dry, is what she meant to say. <laughs> Well, I think that you could make a lot of analogies. I would just say right now, trying to get your handle around the macro picture. Not easy. Breathtaking. And then can you, you imagine like game. making a bet right now? <laughs> no, I really can't. I would. I asked one guest after the show. I'm not going to say who. How hard is it? It's pretty. He was like, he's like, I'm just keeping my head down. <laughs> Greifel's portfolio straight up. Bit dog, thirty four thousand three hundred. It's the only reason she's with us this morning. <laughs> Stay with us. A beautiful autumnal Thursday. This is Bloomberg. We've seen long signals in big tech, mega cap, and we're seeing short signals in the small cap. That tells the consumer the average stock is, is in trouble. Your big, high names, they're doing well, but your average stock is worried about higher rates. Katie Kaminsky of Alpha Simplex, Andrew Loeschop, this lights out yesterday on trend-based, and her trend is higher for longer. She's looking for these yields to sustain, and I believe, Lisa, she sort of indicated, and for yields to move higher. That's what we're seeing today in the last 48 hours off of the many different narratives, the Eastern Mediterranean, what we see in Washington with Speaker Johnson. Uh, the markets, they speak, and with a vengeance, they speak strong dollar today with some real 
Major currency weakness, actually uh, rarely, but today the major currencies are weaker against dollar than EM currencies. And this comes as we expect to get a GDP print for the third quarter that is expected yes. to be 4.5%. The whisper it's number is substantially recession. higher, uh, which is definitely getting people's uh, feeling that maybe the U.S. is continuing to diverge. Meta shares not diverging from the rest <laughs> of the uh, complex. Shares falling after the company warned of a, quote, uncertain revenue outlook for next year. Yeah. This was the dominant narrative, even though the tech giant beat expectations on third quarter revenue. All of this dashing hopes for a long-term recovery in the company's advertising business. It's spending, though, aggressively in other areas, in artificial intelligence and art, uh, virtual reality. It raises this question, you know, what are people hinging on to? Just this hope of uncertainty or expectation of uncertainty that we all know? Just Instagram. <laughs> you know, it's just Instagram. It's it's what Stream is doing over at Instagram. Real. Plus six. You Plus know. six. Mandeep Singh, <laughs> senior technology yeah, analyst. I, I sit there on Instagram and go, that's a short. <laughs> <clears throat> Bloomberg Intelligence joining us now. Mandeep, what does it tell you? That they came out with really good earnings, uh, at least on the fundamental basis, that they say that there's uncertainty and that the shares sell off. Well, so I think uh, they gave a pretty broad guidance, 13 to 24 percent for next quarter. When you see that sort of wide guidance, you know, uh, you know, the company is not sure. And they didn't uh, have that sort of uncertain guidance on the expense side. So they said Reality Labs uh, losses would mount. And I, I think where the company is really failing the investors is not giving them markers around what they are actually doing. I mean, losing $15 billion a year on Reality Labs and not not telling what you are investing in because we know Apple has uh, a new virtual reality headset. It didn't take them $15 billion to make that headset. So clearly they are investing in something right. that nobody knows. And I think that's the uncertainty. How is AI different for Zuckerberg than AI is different for Google, where AI is different for Microsoft? So there is an overlap between Google and Meta's version of AI versus Microsoft's. And Microsoft's uh, corporate, I got to get a job done, let's go. Yeah. And, What's and it, Meta's AI? Meta's AI is you are consuming Instagram feeds, Facebook no. feeds, I mean, uh, the average user is. And so how can AI enhance that experience both for the consumer as well as for the creator who is creating content for the feed? And AI can offer you a lot of tools to generate images right. based on text description. So there is a lot that AI can do in messaging. Yeah, Think of customer service, you know, WhatsApp. Oh, so this is AI and Instagram, I don't buy it. AI and Amazon this afternoon. What is Josie going to spin on AI at, at Amazon? I mean, Amazon's story cardboard box? is about compute training the models. Everyone wants uh, these GPUs to train their large language models Yeah, but they're on. buying AI from Microsoft. I saw that 10 days ago or so, right? Yeah, well, uh, they are upgrading their 365 on-prem version to Microsoft. I'm so. completely lost. <laughs> well, and, and so that's the thing about uh, the generative AI wave, that it is quite broad. And every company can use it in different ways. Some fo companies are focusing on training models. Some fo are focused on inferencing use cases. And uh, it, it I is. Feel, you don't even know what this is, Katie. It feels like a Mork and Mindy skip. Where, you know, Robin Williams is going, no, 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 no. I, I just, everybody's got a different definition of AI. Or I, I guess they're trying to play for a different part of this large pie that everyone sees oh, with generative can you AI. save me? Well, let's talk about something we all know. Let's talk about the cloud business yeah. at Amazon. Of course, AWS, uh, you saw sales growth there, slowed to a record low in the second quarter. We know that the cloud business was why Alphabet had such a bad day yesterday. What are we going to see out of the cloud business at Amazon? I mean, the good thing is uh, expectations are lower for Amazon, and uh, we're talking about mid-teens growth for AWS, and yes, it has the largest base in cloud, but everyone perceives them to be behind with generative AI workloads. That may not be the case. And so there is room for an upside as long as they prove to the street that you know they are catching up with Gen AI and offering the compute that everyone needs uh, to train their models. And not to go back in time, but you think about what happened at Alphabet. I mean, I'm just stuck on the share price move yesterday, yeah. down almost 10% worst day since March 2020. Is that an overreaction? Was it that bad? With Alphabet, it definitely feel, uh, felt like an overreaction simply because the service Search business actually did remarkably well, and unlike Meta, which continues to see ad pricing decline, 
Alphabet saw an ad pricing increase, which is a positive sign. Uh, it's an auction mechanism, so advertisers are bidding up for your ads. And, and there was talk about uncertainty yesterday around the Middle East war and everything that will draw down the advertiser spending. But clearly, uh, Alphabet had a positive print on the search side. And the cloud side, really, the expectations were too high. So I think that's where Amazon may have an advantage going into the print. I want to try to understand the psychology of the investor base <clears throat> and some of these tech names, because it's been shifting over time, and we've seen that. What are we learning about what the key triggers are going to be to buy and what the key triggers are going to be to sell after the gains that we've seen so far this year? I mean, look, the cost of capital is going up. And so I think the days of spending $15 billion a year on moonshots are probably gone, even for larger companies. As long as they keep delivering, you know, 20% plus growth <coughs> meta for meta, everyone is okay with them spending on Reality Labs. The moment the, that growth decelerates, that's when that $15 billion loss really becomes a sticking point for free cash flow. Is that the reason why you expect things for Amazon to be positive? Because they have that infrastructure, AWS, which is the major player in the cloud space. They have that revenue coming in. They have Tom Keen's offspring buying lots of boxes. How much is that really going to play into a positive that could offset some of the negativity that we're hearing from the likes of UPS this morning? Clearly, I think everyone believes that, you know, digital transformation, generative AI, these are secular trends. And right now, I think for Meta to spend $30 billion in CapEx and not have a cloud business or something equivalent is also sticking out because that could have been a key source of diversification for them. This is an arch question. Do you and Anurag Rana see the cloud business? I have no idea what I'm saying. When you see the cloud business, is it a classic duopoly or triopoly, or can there be a set, you know, number five, six, seven players? I just don't buy it. I mean, right now it's a triopoly, and Oracle actually is investing a lot in building its They're cloud business. They're investing, but they do you believe people can grab share and come down and make a fundamental free cash flow generation, or is it going to squeeze into a triopoly? No, I, I think you can, because right now the compute nature of compute is changing. So it's not CPUs consumed on the cloud anymore. It's GPUs, different types of accelerators, different types of databases. And that's where, if you don't have a legacy business, which right. Microsoft does, I think Google has an advantage, Amazon has an advantage, that they don't have a legacy business. And that's where right. they can keep building that. Thank you, Mandeep Singh, thank you so much. John Farrow just emailing in. Yeah. John Farrow, perfect day at Coco K, dovetailing <laughs> nicely into what Royal Caribbean has just done. Jason Jason Liberty and the team at Royal Caribbean just killing it. It's got a cruise ship pop here. People are out spending money on deck 16 of the Symphony of the Sea. I just Googled Coco Gay, and I'm getting all these pictures of, you know, slides and, and slides things that, and you kids, know, and kids and exactly you know, things that we didn't, you know, I can picture John. I don't know which sea they're in. We keep it private. We don't want John's <laughs> oh, yeah. privacy You're to You're keeping be it so invaded, private, you're just but, really putting it in a wrap. Pharaoh, like, you know, he's perfect day at Coco Gay. <laughs> I, I don't get it. I mean, you know, we, Rich, Rich Truman in, in, in radio production, he lives for these things. He's on them like three times a year. Have you I've done it? never done it, but apparently a lot of people are because cruises have been crushing it all year. I mean, you just looking at the stock market, Royal Caribbean is up 66% so far this year. That's before what we saw this morning. And just what we saw this morning, Royal Caribbean are reporting better than expected earnings and boosting their adjusted earnings per share outlook. And the shares are up about 4.4% in pre-market trading. So, John, we want to reach out to you. Thank you for doing your part. No, it is great. At Coco K, we installed four terminals at Coco K, <laughs> just so you know. That's they, a draw. Know, they have different parts of Coco K for different The fake parts news you need to know. Society. Now they've got a camera crew there. They've got like families. Yeah. You want to volunteer and they have a separate. <laughs> they have a separate beach for bratty families. Mm. And That's then the biggest they beach. Have, they have a separate beach for people on vacation going, where's the two stands? That would be John. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> we hope Mr. Farrell is having a good time at Coco K. Julian Emanuel coming up. This is Bloomberg Surveillance.
the dynamics in inflation, in supply and demand globally have shifted. The Fed's going to be higher for longer, probably for a lot longer than people think. We got to the higher rates. What's next? Which stocks are going to succeed, which are going to waver through this new environment? The upward movement in the 10-year note is reflecting a new fair value, which I don't think markets have fully discounted yet. You have to wait for the dice to stop dropping, and the problem is that everybody's been trying to catch them. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. An incredibly busy Thursday. Markets on the move as we go to a look for a buoyant GDP economy. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramwitz, and Tom Keene. Mr. Farrell on assignment. Catherine Guy Reifeld is in for John Farrell here. A spirited conversation. Many narratives. I'm sorry. Everything's blown aside, including the ECB meeting by resurgent yields, Lisa. And that really is going to be the key question for the ECB. How <clears throat> much do they expect this to be doing the work for them? How much do they lean against the idea that this is going to be the last rate hike they haven't or that basically they're not going to raise rates further from here and how much are they going to keep rolling off a balance sheet when people are wondering who is going to buy all this debt when well, governments okay. are facing rates like this but to my price analysis we all go to yield analysis and there's a point where uh, that doesn't work right now it doesn't work price analysis is there and the bid just slips away in the stock market in the bond market the bid slips away for the Japanese yen. It's a worldwide bid slipping away. Which is the reason why I think the reaction to some of these tech earnings has been the most interesting aspect, because mm -hmm. they've actually, yes, they're not all the same. It is a motley group of companies, but there have been uh, companies that reported good earnings and then have gotten beaten up. Is there a message in that that's really highlighting uh, just this feeling of concern underpinning everything? I don't know what the message is, but the question for me becomes, where's your haven in this market? Because whether or not you agree with the logic, I mean, tech has been your safety trade. That's been your haven asset. You're not seeing that in tech. You're not seeing that in bonds. Maybe you're seeing it in the dollar, but it feels like slim pickings out there. Well, slim pickings, but it's also the dynamics of the spread market. What's credit done in the last 48 hours? Is it mirroring the tensions that we see? You have seen a bit of spread widening, which is something that people have continued <clears throat> to uh, express, that you're starting to see a little bit more of yields up. However, Recently, there was a bit more of a bit. I'm looking right now. Spread's coming in. Honestly, what yeah. you're seeing right now is a feeling that things are not cracking, but you are feeling nervousness. That, to me, yeah. is really the headline. The guest is so important here at 7. We're going to do a truncated data check. Futures deteriorate. Negative 25 is now negative 32. The VIX out well over a stick, 21.50. And the yield space, 10-year, 4.96, 5.09, and a 30-year bond. I have spread widening, and i got to get the real 10-year uh, yield up. We don't have that print yet. DXY is going to give me a 107 in an hour. Lisa? What we're looking at today, 8.15 a.m., is that ECB rate decision, followed by an 8.45 a.m. press conference by Christine Lagarde. I don't envy her. This is going to be a difficult performance. Does she repeat what Jay Powell did, yeah. which is basically say, you know, we're not hiking rates. We're going to keep them at four, but we may hike later, and we're going to keep rolling off our balance sheet. And this might be one of the biggest drivers of some of the uncertainty around who's going to pick up all this debt. 8.30 a.m., you talk about dollar strength. Well, get this uh, third quarter GDP is reaccelerating. This to me is going to be also highlighting the dispersion of the U.S. economy with everyone else. The expectation is four and a half percent GDP growth in uh, the third quarter. Bloomberg <clears throat> Economics expected to be 4.9 percent. Janet Yellen will comment on all that. U.S. Treasury Secretary in conversation with our very own Peggy Collins at 1.30 p.m. New York time. But to me, this is underpinning everything. We just have such strength, and that keeps I, coming through. I think the narratives are extraordinary. My head, my, honestly, my head's spinning. I mean, I really don't know what to do with and it. And if you want your head to keep spinning, yeah. after the bell, we get Amazon and Intel. And how much do we see uh, a more kind of right. divergence through the behemoths? And does Amazon, to Katie's point earlier, and it's a good point, give some credence to the, the idea that Google is falling behind? in the triopoly of the cloud computing. We complex. want to talk here about the stock market with Julian Emanuel, Chief Equity and Quantitative Strategist at Evercore ISI. But we first have to pay honor to his uh, publication today in the Harvard Business Review, HBR, on AI. He's done this with a cohort of true techies. Emanuel's not a true techie. <laughs> what did you learn in writing this Don't article? Tell. You took basically Ed Hyman, Julian Emanuel, 
economics and service sector analysis and brought it into a bunch of tech noise for Harvard Business Review. What did you say, well, I really got this wrong about AI, this is what I learned. No, so the bottom line with AI, again, and this is a lot of the fear, we understand that we are in a particular period where information, disinformation, and deep fakes has potential ramifications <coughs> across the globe, but the bigger picture on generative AI is that it is not going to be a discrete job killer like everyone says, okay? What it's going to do right. is help companies connect with their clients, and the way that you connect with your clients okay. is by using the technology to enhance what right. humans John do. John Ludite went to Harvard and I think it was 1682, I can't remember. <laughs> Don't give me your fancy tech you know, babble. People are going to get run over by AI. Who gets run over by AI according to your publication? Well, if, if you look at it, it, it should be the higher income earners, the white collar people, the people in finance. You're looking at me, keep going. <laughs> I, I told you, you're safe, you do communication. You, you know, interpersonal relationships are not going to disappear. <laughs> do I have interpersonal? <laughs> hold my, hold my hand, please. Oh, we're, we're so going personal. To together. It's gonna be oh, amazing. you're killing me. Yeah, Lisa, right. say, would All you right, talk please. the stock market with them and figure out <laughs> this AI I mean, This goes into the whole question around who's winning and who's losing and how we're gonna plan that out. Uh, with respect to some of these earnings, Katrina Dudley of Franklin uh, Temple Mutual si uh, Series earlier came on the show and she said, you know, if higher rates basically push out the losers of the business and they basically give more dominance to the big players. Who's winning based on what we've seen from earnings so far? Well, I mean, you saw it yesterday. The world's largest software company, there's undertones of, you know, positivity in terms of what they're doing in generative AI. And then the world's largest search engine, the undertone is negative because their product seems to be falling behind the rest of, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the behemoths in, in the space. Is there a larger takeaway? And I understand there's quite a bit of difference dispersion. So it's difficult to come out with some sort of overarching tech thesis. But is there a takeaway that people are hesitant to keep piling into some of these tech names evaluations where they are at this moment? Is that a sort of accurate takeaway from the reaction to, to uh, earnings so far? The 5% yield and the geopolitical situation that we're confronting right now is compressing valuations. You will have stocks that do well in earnings, you will have stocks that do poorly in earnings, but the, at the index level, there is a hesitance, and to the conversation earlier, there is one safe haven. It's Tom's triple levered cash fund. <laughs> That's it's just great. But people people think I'm doing a massive two and twenty payout on that. I gotta pay for the leverage. I mean I'm not getting the gross I'm not getting excuse me, the net net return people think I am. You're going on it's leverage because the cost of leverage is too high. And, and, and frankly, yeah. that's one of the issues we're seeing in, in our institutional investors. Katie's yeah. taking notes on this. Katie, <laughs> it's an ETF. You'll I, look for no, it. No, I was about to say, <laughs> I'm seriously surprised that a triple leverage cash ETF hasn't been launched yet because there's an ETF oh, for everything. Hmm. Gensler under the said sun. no. <laughs> Gensler, continue. Continue. Maybe after today. But I want to talk about what this means for managers because you're writing your notes that it's still a stock picker's market. And someone told me yesterday, I have to admit, I can't remember who that if you want to look for stock picking opportunities, look in the small cap space right now because there's a lot of carnage there. There is. Uh, if you look at the Russell 2000, we are on the cusp of breaking through the 2022 lows. And, and frankly, you know, as negative as that sounds, as, as a headline, to us, the likelihood is going to be that that's going to cause a little bit more consternation in the market, a little bit more volatility, a little bit more fear. Uh, it is still October after all. And the fact is, is that there has been no fear this entire cycle since the top in January of 2022. And the fear is what creates the buying opportunity. And what tends to happen is that the worst stocks going in, the small caps, will end up being the winners when we get to the other side. And if I'm trying to take the temperature of stress in this market, is should I be looking at small caps? Because like Lisa, I've been looking at credit spreads for the past few months. I haven't seen anything. But you look at small caps and it's a different story. Yeah, and obviously small caps, the index weighting itself has been a headwind. Light on tech, heavy on the financials component. Uh, but, but again, you look at credit, you look at the VIX, uh, and they are not stressed yet. We don't think this cycle will end until we can see a degree of stress there. Okay, so that where are we in the cycle then? 
Uh, we, we think that, th that this idea that particularly with uh, Ed Hyman's forecast for a slowdown coming next year, that we have uh, a bit more downside. Uh, and to us, again, this idea of uh, the Russell 2000 uh, taking out the 2022 lows will put a bit more consternation in. And we think uh, somewhere around the 200-week moving average uh, in the S&P 500, currently at 39.40, that would represent about 14.5% uh, below uh, the July top. That's where we think consternation becomes a buying opportunity. So what are you doing right now? Are you also going into Tom's new ETF, the triple leverage all cash? You can find it at Tom K. <laughs> Equity there, index. You know, they'll choose this well, they'll show no, because again, this whole idea of dispersion amongst all assets and you know, whether it's credit or equities or whatever is creating opportunities. <clears throat> we like energy for the obvious reasons. We like healthcare because healthcare doesn't care about geopolitics and it doesn't care about interest rates and we like okay. some of these AI centric names but hedged at the end. You had a clean level. shirt on today. Hyman didn't do you with his black marking pen that he, that he uses. You and Ed <laughs> Hyman are elbowing each other as he tries to get out his report and there's one elephant in the room. The elephant is the banks. Do you guys perceive, just collegially, do you perceive true instability in the banking industry or these glide paths to some low? Well, it, 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 the question is, is, you know, we're having these discussions. You have stocks in the, in the banking sector trading six or oh, seven come on. times. Reverse split. Hyman knows this tattooed to his uh, brain. I got Citigroup. It's, it's CityDog. 3.86, $3.86 per pre reverse split. Is the cycle going to end without more stress in, in the financial space? Probably not. However, we got an implicit guarantee right. in March by the Fed. Mm -hmm. We're probably going to yeah. need to Ask hear more. Ask Ed when you get some free time about Continental Illinois. He'll brief <laughs> you on that. Julian Emanuel, thank you so much. Evercore ISI. And look for Mr. Emanuel's important essay in Harvard Business Review uh, this week on AI. What's great about the article, Lisa, it's in English. You know, <laughs> Mandeep sends me articles and I don't understand a word of them. This and, thing called cloud computing. Uh, yeah, well, it's What like, is this? Is it going to take our jobs? You know, I think of a fossil like me, I guess I really don't care. To you two, it's like germ it's a germane discussion. That's why when we hear that, you know, communication is a good thing, I'm going to practice my interpersonal communication skills with my children at home to make sure that they try to clean up yeah. after yeah. themselves. The people skills. The robots can't <laughs> take that. So that's Hopefully. what I'm I would actually encourage them to try. I would enjoy that. <laughs> you know, a manual driving the market lower. Futures deteriorate negative 34. This is standard in poorest futures. Dow futures negative 176. you got a solid uh, a move here, a 1% uh, move as well. And, and the VIX, 21.61. But the standard poorest 500, it's down 8 tenths of a percent. And some of that's coming from some of the other names that we're seeing come out, like Southwest, for example, uh, mm -hmm. which I just wanted to point to quickly because we saw UPS come out beat. We also see Southwest, I mean, excuse me, miss and revise lower some of their expectations. Southwest also revising lower some of their expectations. The idea of how much they're actually charging prices are going down. And that obviously those earnings stories, they're just overwhelming what you're actually seeing in the bond market, which is actually some semblance of stability, dare I say it. Uh, Ten-year yields only up about one basis point. Again, after the moves we've seen, uh, maybe it doesn't I, matter. But at least for once, the epicenter yeah, volatility isn't the I, I, I got a print now in the 10-year real yield, 2.53%. We had one worthy on the show saying 2.7% is sort of you know, back to Volcker, back to what was a normal time, we thought, you know, and Bob Seeger was on top of the charts. The fact that we're talking about stability <laughs> and it's 4.97 percent, 10-year yields, I'm, buttressing I'm up against 5 percent. Manifesting. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, to me, it's just this is stability at new places. Please stay with us through the day. We'll be doing more data checks. Market's really topsy-turvy right now. That yen out through 150. Speaking of stability, we'll go to Washington. Edward Mills joins us with Raymond James on your stable Washington. This is Bloomberg Surveillance in New York. I want to say to the American people, on behalf of all of us here, we hear you. We know the challenges you're facing. We, we know that, uh, that there's a lot going on in our country, domestically and abroad, and we are ready to get to work again to solve those problems, and we will. 
Speaker Johnson uh, there of Louisiana, freshly minted. Mike Johnson with some real controversy. We've been looking at that and uh, a number of conversations this morning. Look at the balance of power this afternoon. We really dig in deep on your new Speaker of the House. We welcome all of you. We really want to, and, and we have done, I've been more guilty of this. Don't tell the guard, but I've really given short shrift to the ECB. We're going to do that at, right now with a brief. This is a brief for the market deteriorating negative 36 standard pours. We're at 1.49, 1, 1.50 points on the VIX, buttressed up against 22, 21.68. The dollar continues to grind to dollar strength off DXY, the major trading pair, one of 680. Oil doesn't play here. $89 a barrel and Brent crude. Sterling, do we get to 119? Euro, do we get to 104? We're not there. Yen, a 150, we're there. I mean, it's amazing. And Lisa, I, I mean, if John was here, he'd be hyperventilating about the ECB. And we got to catch up with Faro analysis here. The ECB, what a tough set of cards they have. Yeah, how do they hike into weakness and how do they not hike at a time when they're still seeing inflation? How do they <clears throat> craft a message that's Powell-esque? in saying, well, we may not hike again, but we may hike and just don't get complacent because we are not. I was scheduled with the Bundesbank's Nagel in Marrakesh and all of a sudden there was an email, dear dear, dear uh, Tom, oops, no, we can't make that meeting. And you, you really wonder how she will convey today in the press conference the core petrified of inflation versus an exterior using inflation as a constructive trade tool. One thing that people keep saying is that this is an ECB that was dramatically late and they fell behind the ball and they have been conditioned yeah. by that experience to remain hawkish for longer. And that really remains the feeling at the ECB that we expect to hear from Christine Lagarde today. And to me, Katie, help me with this with all your great work in technology. I mean, I talk about eurosclerosis and it was, you know, a topic yesterday. It was a topic here. But very quickly here, they're just not technologically as impacted as we are in the midst of our tech earnings season. And that's the structural difference between the European equity market and, of course, the U.S. <coughs> stock yeah. market. We talk about all the doom and gloom on the U.S. side, but you still have the Nasdaq 100 up by more than 30 percent year to date. Thank you, you just don't Thank have you. that heft <clears throat> in the European company side. Miss that rally. Let's move to politics and not uh, uh, talk about uh, the Nasdaq here again. Futures at negative 35. Edward Mills hugely experienced. He is at Raymond James but far more has legit committee and individual Congress people's skills in Washington, particularly working with uh, Maloney of uh, New York. Ed Mills, this new speaker the uproar that I hear, and yet your research note says he can drive to the center. How does the gentleman from Louisiana move the Republicans to a doable center? I think it's going to be a tough task. I think, Tom, the thing that I am most focused on with the new speaker is how quickly at the end it happened in D.C. Things appear impossible right up until the moment it's inevitable. So having a unified uh, Republican caucus uh, is not something we would have thought. But the big question in my mind is this is a speaker who has not been vetted. And as he is vetted, how does he come out of right. that vet? Uh, what type of narrative about his leadership? And I think what we're talking about is for him to keep that, for him to keep the seat, for him to be able to govern, um, you do need to find the middle. Because what right. we've seen is that the fringe uh, does not support many legislative packages, right. and that's paralysis. Help me with the sequence here, horse before cart. Is November 17th in a government shutdown prior to the defense allocations? You mentioned the first task of Senate, House, House, Senate is, well, war funding, if you, you will. Is that going to be before November 17th? I, I think it's a, kind of a toss up between the two. I think to start with the November 17th deadline, uh, Tom, um, we're not going to have a government shutdown. It looks like we are going to uh, punt uh, government funding either into January or maybe as far as April. Um, but in doing that, there will be the conversation about defense funding. Uh, the president has sent up to Congress uh, a robust uh, supplemental package. Um, and what we're hearing is the Senate will want to have a strong bipartisan vote on that, trying to put pressure on the House, not differentiating aid for Ukraine from Israel or Taiwan. 
So how do you understand, Ed, the fact that Mike Johnson has made a real uh, important issue of his cutting the deficit, and yet there are all of these requests to finance some pretty big uh, military expenditures. How much is that going to be a sticking point that makes it uncertain whether we get this aid across? We were speaking earlier with John Lieber of Eurasia, and he was saying, we're going to get it passed. Are you as confident? I am confident that we'll get something passed. I think that the big question is timing in the scale of this, Lisa. Uh, when you go back to some of the other pushes to become speaker, uh, this was probably most out in the focus uh, during the push for Jim Jordan. Uh, the only way some of the defense hawks within the Republican caucus were willing to support him, and the expectation is the only reason why they're willing to support Johnson, was that they needed to get a guarantee on a robust defense bill, extra defense funding, and a defense authorization act before the end of the year. Uh, that group is far greater than the four needed to keep that speakership. So if he wants to keep that speakership, he's been against that defense aid in the past and especially voted against Ukraine aid. Uh, but the geopolitical environment's very different now, and his political position is completely changed. And Ed, to do all that, you made the point that Johnson really needs to find the middle here. but. If he doesn't, I was speaking to Henrietta Trays yesterday, and she made the point that the Senate is still functional. That's the saving grace, because at the end of the day, the House will do what the Senate tells it to. Do you agree with that logic? Uh, largely. I think when you see uh, the Senate, if they pass something with 80, 90 votes, uh, it's not a politically tenable position not to even have a vote on that in the House. And if you were to have a vote on something that passed with 80 or 90 of the 100 votes in the Senate uh, in the House, it's near guaranteed to have a majority go to the president's desk. Um, and I do think Johnson has a little bit of leeway here where he doesn't have the baggage of some of the previous ones. So some of the first right. fights, which will be government funding and uh, defense funding, he's not necessarily going to get blamed for the position that Republicans are in because he's new right. to the job. Hey, you know, Ed Mills, I look at this. I was taking Anne Marie Horton 302, which is advanced civics lessons inside the Beltway. And I guess every speaker has a lot of power. Is he going to blow up the leadership of the Republican Party, or is he going to attach himself to, say, the hockey player from Minnesota and the others? Well, I think he's going to attach himself to the majority leader. I think I'd go back to uh, the last time we had a speaker that no one really had heard of, uh, which was Speaker Hassert. And you had the most empowered majority leader kind of in decades with Tom DeLay. Right. When you saw him have oh, the wow. press History. conference and, and there was some booze by Virginia Fox, what I was watching is Steve Scalise, the majority leader from his state of Louisiana, was standing right behind him and told him exactly what he said. He said, next question, let's talk about policy. Then Mike Johnson said, next question. So he is a lockstep with the current <laughs> majority. And that, and that is the Ed Mills perspective that's so valuable with Raymond James. Ed Mills, thank you so much for wisdom on thank Capitol you. Hill. Can I just say this? Congressman Tom Massey, a Kentucky Republican, came out yeah, after this him. and yeah, said, joy. nobody hates him. He was talking about Mike Johnson. <laughs> That's his best asset. That's what Farrell says about me. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that nobody hates you. You could be but speaker. Oh, maybe not. OK, futures negative 35. got to get back to the data. The market's here, folks, into the jobs report in one hour, into these important ECB meetings are, are really sport. Lisa, I'm just looking at an unraveling. And yeah. frankly, bonds aren't helping me here. Tenure, 4.97%. Yeah, stability, but in the wrong <clears> direction. <throat> and it's the day is young. I mean, it took not that much to suddenly get things unmoored. And the, Again, 150.34. Good morning, Pacific Rim. On the ECB, Alberto Gallo of Andromeda Capital will do that next. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Surveillance Worldwide, thank you for joining on radio and television. John Farrell, Lisa Bramlitz, and Tom Keene. Farrell on assignment. Catherine Greifeld with us today. And market's really on the move. We'll do more data checks for you, but we're not going to do them right now because, you know, Basic showed up with her entourage, and she's like, can we rush through this and get to me? Uh, negative 34 on the SPX. We're out. VIX widens out, 21.61. That's all the data you get right now on one hour to claims as well. A quick under surveillance. Yeah, we'll give you a little bit more data and under surveillance.
surveillance with respect to Meta sliding in pre-market trading uh, despite a beat on third quarter revenue. This comes after comments on the economic outlook and uncertainty uh, that this is really what's driving shares. Meta contributing to the losses, what we've seen in the NASDAQ yesterday. Amazon set to report after the closing bell. I think this is going to be interesting. The response, Katie, just quickly here to me is going to be the most interesting thing with Amazon. Yeah, the stakes are super high for Amazon right now after what we've seen so far this week. From the market perspective, of course, as Mandeep Singh was telling us a little bit earlier, maybe expectations lower when it comes to the cloud business. Yeah, and this is what uh, certainly has been driving the response. Over in Detroit, Ford and, the, Ford and the UAW coming to a tentative agreement to end the six-week long strike. Ford agreeing to a 25% boost in wages with added cost of living allowances. Details on benefits and unionization at EV battery plants remain to be seen. The deal still needs to be ratified among 57,000 employees who will get back to work in the meantime. But really, all eyes on GM yeah, and Solantis. They They're going to meet with negotiators, but don't they basically have to say, OK, we'll go along with it. Ford set the tone <clears throat> yet again. Oh, we'll have to see. Is that it? I mean, is, is that what we got here on under surveillance? No, there's One another, more big there's announcement. another announcement. Uh, drum roll, no, go. There's even more. Finally. But wait, I'll throw this one in too. Morgan Stanley's Ted Pick will become the bank's next CEO, taking over from James Gorman after his 14 year run. Pick, who is a current co president, will take over in January. Gorman staying on as executive chairman. Bloomberg's very own Shanali Basik will be interviewing both of them today in about uh, three hours time. Shanali, what do you want to know? Uh, what's fascinating here is that, yes, the seamless transition is happening. Ted Pick was rumored for a CEO spot for the better part of a decade, can you imagine? And now you have Andy Saperstein and Dan Simkowitz who are in consideration for this top spot. They are staying on. What is he going to do to keep them around? And on top of that, you have Andy Saperstein, who's been really running that wealth management business, also now taking on asset management business. How do you keep him happy? How do you make sure that you're going to inspire him? him to uh, keep that ship running, okay. particularly if the economy gets tough. But the ballet here is everything's fine. You're going to get kumbaya this morning with Mr. Pick. I get that. The fact is everyone will pounce. Which kind of institution would these two worthies go to? Listen, Pick inherited a blessing here. When James Gorman had taken over Morgan Stanley, it was barely a $40 billion firm, give or take. Goldman Sachs was double the market, more than double the market cap. Now Morgan Stanley is worth about $20 billion more, depending on what day you're on. But, you know, uh, Pick is now entering a time where if markets get tumultuous, can he keep up the trading? Can he keep up the wealth management numbers? The most recent quarter they missed. Yeah, but where do these two guys go? Don't give me this kumbaya, we're all in it, we're going to get stock options and stick around. I just don't buy it for a minute. It's never minute. kumbaya, what, isn't what, it, what, what, at the end of the day. What kind of institutions would want to pick up these valuable talents? And you think about it also. You have John Pruzan, who used to be the COO of the firm, was also a contender for a while. He's now running Predium, looking to do deals to expand Predium in terms of um, you know, expanding his asset management base. You have to wonder, you know, Harvey Schwartz from Goldman to Carlisle. Exactly. These private asset Thank managers you. are picking off talent and they're picking them off hard. I also want to talk about Morgan Stanley under Ted Pick because as I understand it, it's not going to look too different. It sounds like we're not expecting anything huge in the way of strategy shifts. Really, this is a Morgan Stanley we know. But one thing I wonder about too is you think about the big deals that Morgan Stanley has done. They've done the largest acquisition since the financial crisis. Goldman wasn't able to pull that off. They had to reverse the deals that they had done when they looked to diversifying. James Gorman had said they could do more deals, but if you have Ted Pick coming into the guard, is he willing to do more transformation? Formative m a when he's still getting the seat warm. I think that the transition period for him and what he looks like as a leader, guys, this was a man that just five years ago was known as a bit of a bull in his china shop. Uh, a, yeah, a gleefully profane is how Bloomberg Sridhar Natarajan called him in a story pretty recently. But he's really become much more of a leader and much more poised. And watching him become a leader has been pretty fascinating over the last couple of years. Yeah, much more uh, of what we're seeing out of uh, Casa Diamond. I am I'm curious, though, what took so long? Because this took a while after they announced it. That was absolutely the scuttle in the market, right? Why? Why? If we knew Ted was the one that was being groomed for so long, what took so long? Uh, I, were there doubts, frankly, at the end of the day? There are things that are unresolved. For example, no. a block trading investigation. <clears throat> uh, equities performance has slipped a little under Ted Pick. And is asset management and wealth the future of Morgan Stanley? Right. These are the existential questions. Shanali Basak with Mr. Pick will look for that. 
that in the 10 o'clock hour uh, this morning. Right now, on our first discussion, I'm sorry for this, folks, here at 7.35 New York time on the ECB, Alberto Gallo joins Chief Investment Officer, co-founder of Andromeda Capital Management. Alberto, what is Lagarde's greatest challenge today in the press conference? Good morning. The ECB has definitely made a policy error here. They were too late to hike. Uh, they, the plane lifted off too late, and now they're trying to keep the plane in the air, but uh, the economy is running out of fuel. In Europe, we already see signs of you know, lower earnings and a technical recession uh, in Germany and Italy. And so keeping this 4% ECB rate is going to become a challenge. And on top of that, you have the hawkish members of the ECB that are now talking about balance sheet reduction. So the ECB has been very late in the game, and now it's trying to cling on the same stance as the Fed, perhaps to defend right. the euro, but the U.S. is a much stronger economy, and the ECB at some point is going to break something. That's the, that's the real challenge. How much of Europe is in the vicinity of recession? We've had wide reporting on the German slowdown. Maybe it's due to China, maybe this, maybe that. But is the continent is a general statement in a malaise? No, we, we have, you know, growth around zero. I would say this is more of a bump. It's not a heavy recession, but still, you know, high rates don't help. Now, next year, going into next year, we have um, Euro Parliament elections. We have elections in the UK, but we, um, you know, we don't have the same momentum that we had on the fiscal side that we had this year. Uh, so there's going to be, especially in the second half of next year, a curb into spending. There's no discussion of austerity. You know, the U.S. continues to spend. The GDP is growing above 4%. So globally, we're still in a positive growth environment. But the ECB is stuck in this situation, trying to essentially copy the Fed. And the European banking system is solid, has given them, you know, a good a good um, moment of strength after Credit Suisse. No European bank was in trouble, but uh, it's the real economy that's uh, that's not doing so well. And so what breaks, uh, you know, you have BDP spreads above 200, you have countries that want to continue to spend, but, you know, very high interest rates. So some things, some things are going to break. They have to choose between keeping the euro above parity or keeping BDP spreads where they are. So how do you invest, right? I mean, how do you get confident about anything in Europe right now? If you're waiting for things to break and you don't have confidence that the ECB or the economic momentum can save it on the other side? So, look, Lisa, what we're seeing today is that there's a few things that are bending. And our job is to choose the ones that are bending but are not going to break. So you've got companies that are bad, uh, that don't have a sustainable business model, and you know they were used to funding a 2%, now they're funding a 10 We don't look at that. Uh, then there's the good stuff that uh, usually is, um, sometimes it's expensive, it's tight, sometimes it's cheaper. And then there's the ugly, which are companies that have to sell assets. You know, they're going to get some, in some cases, government help. A lot of European firms get government help. And so it's much better to look at, you know, corporate debt or bank debt in this environment where governments don't want to have high unemployment and they help firms like, you know, Telecom Italia or, you know, even Burger King in France or the airlines, you know, go, go help. So the margin, the margin of safety, you know, very important value investor concept, you know, we, we're always looking for things that have a margin of safety that can survive in a 10 to 15 percent default environment. So even in a large crisis and that's that's starting to be cheap now. So we're happy to see that there is a bit of fear because we're getting paid for it. How about in the uh, European banking space? We've seen a bunch of earnings come out. Uh, the latest with Standard Chartered this morning, really highlighting how much the Chinese story is hurting some of its financials. How can you get confident in a banking system that, okay, maybe isn't breaking, but it doesn't really show signs of uh, really thriving in this environment? So look, big differentiation. Uh, we don't like the UK. The UK is in stagflation. There's, um, you know, a declining property market, entrenched inflation. If you look at the eurozone, we're focusing on commercial banks, investment banks have still a lot of, you know, challenging business um, environment, and and so we're looking at commercial banks and the large ones, and the large, the large commercial banks in Europe are pretty much killing it. I mean, we're still in the phase where high interest rates help earnings. We're going to get into a phase where the economy does a bit worse and non-performing loans um, start rising. But let's remember that 
banks have gone through a lot of consolidation. Um, you know, think about unique credit results and how they want to, you know, buy banks in Greece. Greece has got, a, got an upgraded to investment grade. Um, so there are areas of the market that are coming back from being high yield rated back to the investment grade part. And, you know, if you look at earnings and, and dividends, you know, banks are doing pretty well. Do I think it's an equity trade? No. Um, equities have done pretty well and probably earnings in the next, going into next year would be a little bit weaker. But, you know, solvency, you've got a pretty good buffer of, of returns and profitability before you start worrying about solvency. And so, yeah. And that's also true for corporates. They've termed out maturities, leverage is low. So default rates are going to rise, but they're going to rise to 4 or 5% from 2%. Right. We're not in a 10% default environment. There's a ton Still of money waiting in private wow. debt. Uh, and these stress funds, and yeah. they're not getting they're not getting opportunities. Well, to wait for another conversation, the ton of money that's out there. Alberto Gallo, thank you so much for the brief with Andromeda Capital, and this towards the ECB meeting at 7:41 within the hour. We get jobless claims. Do you know surveillance correction? I said jobs report. Oh. I was chastised by a listener. It is <laughs> a report on jobs. Just it is a claim. Jobless jobs claims reports once report. a month. Claims is weekly. Report. I know that it's a report. Yeah, everything's report. claims. 8:30. It's been a spectacular spectacular number. We'll see what that is. But far more importantly, GDP, uh, Katie, Katie, uh, the two of you, Katie, help me here. Four and a half percent, I guess. What's the whisper number? It's, uh, it's higher, and that apparently is very scary. And we'll see. Again, we've been talking about this awkward position that the Fed is in. And, of course, Alberto Gallo also brought up the fact that you look at U.S. spending. It's also the fiscal side that's working against the Fed here. A lot of resilience. Honestly, I'm just looking at the fact that this is not necessarily what the Fed wants to see. Torsten Slot coming out earlier and said yeah. the most understated thing is what the Fed needs to do to actually get inflation under control. And he mentioned super core inflation in the vicinity of 4% percent. Markets are in the move. We're going to do complete data checks for you through the morning. The Standard & Poor's 500 down 34 points, down 8 tenths of a percent. When you talk about the whisper number, the Bloomberg economics number is 4.9 percent for U.S. GDP. That's and where Anna Wong get, is. That's where Anna Wong is. Yeah, and trying to get your head around the idea of a reacceleration heading into a period where, yes, we're worried about weakness, but we're not seeing it in the same kind of bulk. We're seeing it around the margins. Did you see how Housing starts, I was deep into the surveillance nap yesterday, but housing starts, was, weren't they good? There was housing statistics yesterday that were like, really? I mean, the housing market, I keep asking people about it. I keep getting the housing market is broken. And when it comes to the home builders, they're in a strange spot. I mean, they've been mm -hmm. profiting all year. I mean, you look at the stock prices, they've just been shooting higher. But now it's getting a little bit trickier, and the data is just back and forth. So new home sales came out yesterday at 10 a.m. That's what you're talking about, I think. And the expectation was for 680,000 new home sales. It came in at 759,000. What do you do with that? What you do with that is you know that it's broken yeah. because what people are doing is they're not buying existing homes because nobody wants to sell them and to buy them you got to take out a mortgage but a lot of these developers yeah. are offering mortgage rates that are a lot lower than that eight percent to move inventory so it's a sort of separate yeah. market unto itself to avoid entirely any kind of connection could you see me rates. as a realtor in the <laughs> suburbs <laughs> you, let's look at the can pool. you imagine <laughs> I, I think you'd be great let's, garage. Look, let's, let's look, look at, the, at the garage it's yeah. a three-car garage perfect for you <laughs> we'll practice in the break. 8.09% more. It's no problem. We can deal <laughs> uh, with that. Uh, fascinating. I, I, my head's spinning. Negative 32 on SPX. Michael Nathan said on the New York Yankees. We do that next. This is Bloomberg. <laughs> I think we're already seeing those low upgrade rates. Our upgrade rate, 2.7 percent this quarter, was one of the lowest ever. And um, so you're already in a run rate where, because of the high prices of the phones, people yep. are kind of taking their time. If anything, you know, we're putting out offers out there right now, like our new Go 5G Next program, that allows people to have a look at moving faster if they would like, uh, because there's an audience <clears throat> that wants a new one every year, like me. Michael Siebert, T-Mobile president and CEO. What is the number one thing in corporate analysis I've been wrong on for years? I got John Legere 
totally wrong and had the honor of speaking to him about it. The guy with the pink T-shirt on, long hair. He doesn't look McKinsey. You know, he's not going to do a NASDAQ. Neither did that guy. He's not going to do a NASDAQ opening. You're not going to put him on camera. This guy's a buffoon. T-Mobile's going nowhere. What do the Germans know? Boom, they changed our world. And they're trying to continue in that in that kind of vein. What was that, a hoodie? I think so. <laughs> or is that like sort of a, a jacket with a big T on it? This is cool. Tea? They, own, they bought out. Harry Kane for Bayern. And, you know, I mean, it's a, like the number one corporate story I've been most wrong on in a million years. And at this point, how do they sort of feature into, you never actually have to pay for your uh, new iPhone because they will help finance, right? Is that sort of the game <clears throat> now in the uh, yeah. mobile phone space? They, keep, they get a website to keep track of the number of AirPods under the couch. Uh, negative 31 on the on the SPX right now. We're down eight tenths of a percent. NASDAQ down a full one percent. That's important. The VIX 21.47. In the bond space, you have a little bit of disinversion. I've got a 10-year real yield of 2.53 percent. That is jaw-dropping. And a 30-year mortgage, 8.09 uh, percent. Joining us right now, John Farrow on assignment, Catherine Greifeld with us this morning. Michael Nathanson joins us. He's senior research analyst at Moffitt Nathanson on a plethora of things. Lisa, why don't you drag in Nathanson here <laughs> on Facebook? Because you know the story better than I do. All right, Michael, thank you for joining us. I want to start with the one note of caution that really drove all of the price action. They came out and said, we don't know what's going to happen. What else is new? Advertising, who knows? Oh my goodness, the stock fell. How realistic is this or instructive of what we can expect in the year to come? Yeah, I uh, I was disappointed by that fact that the market took that comment around with it. These guys just put up 23% ag growth in a quarter. And a year ago, people were thinking this business was dead, right? All the momentum is behind them. They called out a little bit of choppiness because of what's happening in the Middle East. But I don't think it's that big of a deal. I mean, their guidance is still pretty strong. So I think this is a this is an amazing story in terms of Tom and T-Mobile. This could be the, you know, this could be the second story that people have just underestimated the strength of a business model. It, the recovery's been amazing. There's really been has. a lot of there's been a lot of questions though around just in general the online advertising business, especially at a time where all of the content creators are facing off with consumers that really don't like advertising and are willing to spend right. to avoid it. How much are we seeing with respect to consolidation of market share at the likes of Meta at a time when Google also also saw an increase in ad spend despite their cloud issues. What does that tell us about the overall market versus just consolidation with the with the leaders? Okay, big picture, those two companies, the, the growth rates of Meta and Alphabet are back to where they were in early 22. So if you remember the past couple of quarters, there's all kinds of worries about e-commerce slowing, it's getting better, about changes to Apple's IDFA system that's that's been fixed. Um, so it says to you like the market's actually really healthy, and that you're seeing kind of the structural tailwinds of e-commerce and online gaming discontinue. Right, we had a very tough compare in 2022 that's now behind you. So I feel pretty good about the health of this business for the scale right. players for for a Snap for a Twitter. Good luck to you. That's not going to happen. You know, Michael Nathanson, congratulations. Netflix has done a double. It's off. Mark, Mark Mahaney, what's he know? He's going up another $100 on Netflix. Review for us the winner of streaming. Is Netflix an, a Microsoft equivalent, even at 38 times earnings? It's a good question, Tom. It's different than, than Microsoft because you don't have the operating leverage, you know, longer term, right? So you have to keep investing in content. The great thing about software models is that incremental margins are massive. Once you build it, you, you get the benefit of scale. In media, um, for the most part, in, in the streaming model, you have to keep investing in content. So they all have margin leverage, but nowhere near the same margin leverage of what we saw last night with Meta or Microsoft. So, but in streaming, they're a winner just because it's such a tough business for everyone that's not Netflix right now. So it's really, oh, there's wow. one winner, there's Disney, and then there's everyone, oh. Disney's not even a winner yet. And they're only just churning cash flow to get your attention. Yeah, but you know, I just brought up the Disney chart. You know, I just I, we do this for Michael Nathanson, folks, to give him give him uh, a little bit of angst here on a Thursday morning. Yes. Michael Nathanson, Disney is back to 2014 pricing. Help. Yep. When does it yep. turn? You've been wrong, wrong, wrong. It's been like the New York Yankees. It's a disaster, I say. When does Thank Disney, you. When does Disney Thank churn? You. 
Can I just say Upgrader when Bob Iger came back at 90 bucks and it's just been painful for me. So thank you, Tom, for reminding me. It's good. That's what we it's do. Got a, it's got exactly. <laughs> and sell and sell houses in the suburbs. So here's what here's what I think is gonna happen. 2024 is a year of their they have to consolidate Hulu and Disney Plus. Margins in streaming are negative. Netflix is in the 20s. To me, it's about streaming profitability in 2024. And they have to get Hulu in house, which is going to happen by hopefully the end of the year. So I have a lost wow. hope in Disney. I think I think that is, again, I think this is your meta in twenty four. I mean, a year ago people were were killing the stock, and I think that Disney could be a great stock in twenty four. But you need to get streaming margins up to a level that people start caring about, which is going to take some time. Well, Michael, it's really interesting to hear this conversation because you're still a buy on Disney. Okay, could be a great stock in 2024, but to meditate a little bit longer on your Netflix comments, you're still neutral on the stock. Yeah. What would bump you up to a buy? Bump me up to a buy would be to have earnings numbers because valuation, to Thomas' point, to me is it's pretty full. Look at it versus Google, the Alphabet, or, or Meta. To me, it's having faith in numbers that are above consensus. I think we all have the same numbers now. We pretty much have modeled what the companies told us. There's no way to doubt it at this point. So, you know, pretty much we're just debating multiple at this point. I don't think people have a real edge on earnings, and our numbers are pretty much where consensus is. Where at Meta and other names, we've been above consensus, and that's been our call. You know, we, we have conviction that numbers are wrong to the upside. We'll, we'll get very aggressive about the, uh, about the buy rating. And when it comes to Netflix and the streaming business in general, how does Netflix maintain market share here? Does that really all just come back to the content slate? Well, it's interesting. You know, when they built their business, they borrowed other people's content. And we were writing for many years that that was a dumb idea. So they would rent the office. They would rent friends. Given the state of media, you're starting to see evidence that they could go back to renting other people's content, which is a very cost-effective way to build a business. So what can happen longer term is that they can blend from making all these originals, which is a much tougher business, to renting people's movies and TV shows. And given, again, the state of media companies, that could happen. You know, I don't think Disney will do that, but, you know, Warner's, Paramount, you know, NBC Universal have talked about licensing more content. Mike, what are you expecting to hear after the bell when we get Amazon earnings, particularly around the acquisition of content having to do with sports, NFL, the last sort of death knell for cable? Right. So Mike Morton covers it for Amazon for us. He's very bullish on next year's margin opportunity. They're going to be looking at the NBA, right? So the NFL has gone well for them. The ratings are up in a really strong amount this year. And the NBA is the next big package up for grabs. And there's a good chance that they can get a <clears> slate <throat> of games, you know, getting a Tuesday or Thursday night games. So I think they're going to tell you that, look, it's going well. We see this as a chance, to your point, to really disintermediate cable networks. I think they're going to go for it. So, you know, Amazon to us is 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 really in the second or third position behind ESPN for getting the next right. set of big rights here for sports. Award-winning Michael Nathanson with just decades of good, good news here and on Disney, which will excel into 2024 with Moffat Thank Nathanson, you, Michael Nathanson uh, uh, there. You know, he and I are going back and forth because he knows I know the, the game and the number one value add, and I, I do this at lectures, when you lose money, really, really, really think about what you got wrong. That's far more important than going, I nailed Meta, you know, a year ago, Moonshot. It's like, okay, what did I get wrong about this? And, and once again, with Disney, I would opine that these are structural changes. I don't have his enthusiasm about streaming because everybody at home is watching YouTube. <laughs> well, that's exactly it's right. It's simple that. Although it's an age thing, too, because I will say that some people with young children might be using uh, other you streaming know, how networks. How many young children are there out there? I mean, you know, it's, <laughs> it's a, I get it. It's a segment. <laughs> but Netflix is not looking at a segment, are they? I don't know. Maybe they should be looking at TikTok because I don't know how Oh, uh, you. Are you long, on TikTok? Unfortunately, I am. God, this is like so hip. It's the you future. Know. You gotta stay up. Is Pharaoh on TikTok? Absolutely not. Yeah, I don't, <laughs> I'm not on He's not doing the dances. Well, TikTok, I don't know, versus Snap. You know, it's got some content. Claims in 30 minutes. Lagarde next.
we are in a stagflation environment already. The balance between aggregate savings and investment has shifted. We're at a point where there's some interest to buy because we've come so far in this disinversion in the yield curve. The assumption is that these rates are punishingly high. If they're not, then there is room for them to keep going up. Keep that powder dry because things are still going to be rough going into next year. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. It's ECB Day. It's U.S. GDP Day. It is Amazon Earnings Day. Good morning. Welcome back. Bloomberg Surveillance here in New York. Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Abramowitz. John is off this week. He is back next week. Katie Greifeld sitting so in, says. which is a beautiful thing. And Tom, we have almost forgotten ECB and all of the other news. And yeah. part of this is because they're not expected to do anything. They also have a very difficult problem on their hands. They've got a difficult problem on their hand, and it's different than the U.S. I'm going to call it eurosclerosis, which is maybe not fun, but I got too many people agreeing with me that eurosclerosis is still out there. I'm not sure Lagarde will address that in the press conference. What's important, in Maria Tadeo in Athens, Lagarde in a speech last evening in Greece, massive victory lap for Greece and all they've done coming out of their challenges. Lagarde, Athens, the best that Europe can be. Deflation, up to 12% inflation, and they are now down two-ish on inflation in Greece. That's a victory lap for the prime minister. Great. They can have a victory lap. You know who can't have a victory lap? Uh, anyone over in Germany, in Italy, et cetera. There are plenty of their economies that she's going to be grappling with. And how much is this a European story, Tom? And how much is this a U.S. story? And the contrast <laughs> between uh, what's going on with the European stagnation and the U.S. strength that we're expecting uh, at 830 here. But are they combined? And it's a Venn diagram, and I'm not sure on radio I'm doing the crossy crossy over the Venn diagram. I'm not sure the linkages and all that, but you know, I'm sorry, inflation's inflation. If you're grocery shopping in Athens, it's the same as in London or in uh, New York, and the answer is prices are up. Okay, don't give me this three month annualized baloney. Over the last three years, Prices are up big. That's a challenge of Lagarde. Which is a reason why, Katie, a lot of people are wondering how much she can lean into any kind of pause, mm -hmm. how much she has to really take a harsh tone saying this is unacceptable, even though Europe's in recession. Exactly. And I mean, it's a difficult needle to thread. You think about all the different nations that she has to keep an eye on and the idiosyncrasies between them. But it's interesting that so far the playbook seems to be similar to the Fed as in we're going to signal that we're going to keep rates on hold. But the big difference, of course, is their balance sheet and it, whether we're going to get any news around that. And the other difference uh, really is uh, the tech story in the U.S. I think it's really telling that on this sort of uh, confusing brew of different points, ECB, we've got U.S. GDP. We've got Amazon coming out after the bell and, of course, the geopolitical overhang. The tech earnings really has been what's been driving also the U.S. strength on a whole host of, of levels. So, Katie, I mean, how much is that going to offset whatever the European region can do? Because the U.S. is leaning into that story and leading. Leaning into that story and leading, of course, driving it to the downside uh, this morning and this week when it comes to the U.S. stock market. But it's interesting, too, the messaging coming out of Europe when it comes to the idea that the bond market, markets in general, are going to do the work for the central bank. If I were a central banker, I would be kind of uncomfortable with that narrative because that's a very fine line into something unsustainable. I, uh, to me, and, and, and this is, again, where the market's on the move, and they're a little better over the last 20 minutes, I don't think anybody in the rearview mirror, we can say, has confidence forward. I don't know how Lagarde states a buoyant confidence today about this is the view forward, this is what we believe, and I feel that pulls right over to November 1st. Powell's going to be the same way. Okay, here's where we are. He'll know GDP in, what, 26 minutes, and maybe he knows it already. But, but the answer is, I don't get much conviction out of this meeting today or what we're going to see November 1st. And to build on that, Mohamed el Arian came out and really pushed back against the idea of following data that's backward-looking at a time when you kind of need a theory to drive you forward into the future. So this uncertainty can only work for so long, and that's certainly what we have seen uh, pretty consistently. The uncertainty in markets right now has been negative. Negativity. And we've seen that uh, with a bit of a softness to the tape, even after yesterday's worst day for the NASDAQ going back to February. S&P futures down seven-tenths of a percent. Really, I am watching the euro this morning. I think it's going to be interesting to see uh, whether it, it, how it responds to anything that Christine Lagarde says. I mean, honestly, Tom, what happens if she comes out and she's hawkish? Does that give the euro a lift? I, I don't, I or does it actually beat it up because all of a sudden that makes it more difficult for the economy to get off the ground? She's going to try to say nothing. 
nothing is what she's going to do. You DXY 106.80 here launching out near 107. Yen taking the headlines, 150 level. And Yen, you mentioned Euro, do we go under 104 uh, and, and such. But but to me, going in here, and this is the great unspoken, and she can address this because with her work with the French government, I'm sorry, the banking industry at the end of the day is what I'm watching. Individual stocks, Keith Briette and Woods, I haven't looked at BNP Paribas and the others, which Lagarde has lived. But just as a general, when I see the Bloomberg screen the way it is, I'm thinking I better watch the banks, better watch the financials. Regionals have been telling a pretty dire story in the U.S. In Europe, it has been a little bit more intact. We have gotten earnings for a number of the big European banks, and they haven't been as positive as those in the U.S., and that's something that really has come to the fore. As we head toward that 8.15 wow. rate decision, about 10 minutes, 9 minutes, Jeremy Stretch going to be combing through all of it, head of G10 FX strategy at CIBC. I want to start Good morning. with the response of the euro. If Christine Lagarde comes out with a hawkish tone, does the euro gain or does the euro lose versus the dollar? Well, I think, first and foremost, I think Tom's point about uh, Lagarde trying to say nothing at all is probably about right. But if she were to be relatively hawkish, so if she starts to talk about the prospect of additional tithing or perhaps also addresses the question about a faster <laughs> adjustment to the balance sheet, then yes, we may well get an initial knee-jerk reaction higher yeah. in terms of the euro. But going back to your point about uh, eurozone sclerosis, then I think that would merely provide better opportunities or better levels to right. sell into because in the context of the next half an hour or so, not only are we seeing the ECB, but of course we're seeing that uh, US GDP print. And I think the <clears> contrast between the uh, momentum in the US relative to the Eurozone, even if we're talking about backward looking data in most instances, still favors the dollar. So I think it is very much the case that uh, if we do see any hawkish narrative from Lagarde, it's uh, likely to be merely uh, used as fodder for better levels to sell, right. because I think the path of least resistance is still towards a cheaper Euro over the course of the next few weeks and months. Jeremy Stretch, Sonali Basic will have a conversation with Mr. Pick of Morgan Stanley, their new, newly minted leader here today. Let's get out front of Gorman and Pick. And I, I, I just want you to take all your years of experience and fold in the ability to have instability given what you see in the currency pairs. Do they signal instability to come for financial institutions? Well, I think I, I was listening to your discussion about uh, the banking sector in Europe, and clearly if we are going to have a protracted period of underperformance in the Eurozone, then that is going to prove to be a challenge for the banking sector, and particularly those banks that are very heavily leveraged into the Eurozone and will be impacted by that uh, relative uh, underperformance. So I think we are still in an environment where the dollar is uh, proving to be the uh, safest haven, and so that continues to perform strongly, uh, and there is still obviously a divergence between what's happening in the Fed and elsewhere in the other central banks. So I think we are going to see uh, further instability playing out over the course of the uh, uh, next few weeks, weeks well into uh, 2024. And of course, you, you, you also have to think about not only the macroeconomic variables, which remain challenging, but there is that overarching issue of the geopolitics and the influence that that has in terms of uh, uh, factors such as the energy markets, which just underline the uncertainties ahead, which do make uh, investing in some of those uh, financials certainly something of a challenge. I'm going to stay on Euro here now at 808, folks, with claims here in 21 minutes in America, and of course Lagarde here in, in, in seven minutes. What is your call on Euro? I mean, you mentioned Eurosclerosis earlier, all the different challenges, but on a flow or on a rate policy, a rate story, do you model out, can I get shocking here and say you model out weaker Euro to, to 105 to parity? Well, I wrote a piece uh, a couple of weeks ago suggesting, are we ready for a parity run? And I did suggest that we're not ready for parity yet, but I think we were and are likely to see a retreat back towards 102. Now, of course, if we get to 102, the potential yeah, for a yeah, blowout towards parity is, 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 is clearly... Uh, amplified. So I think we are in a scenario where uh, the rate trajectories are still very much in favor of the U.S. over the Eurozone. The growth yeah. trajectories follow that as well. And I think from a positioning standpoint, we are still in a scenario where there are uh, still uh, stale longs in the uh, in the Euro, which are and do need to be uh, continue to be washed out. So I think as we see that right. uh, position unwind, then that does provide scope for additional Euro weakening over the uh, over the period. The ECB's in Athens today. That was literally Greek, what you heard from Jeremy Stretch. Katie, let me 
me uh, uh, translate here. 105, 104, 103 is weaker euro. Mm -hmm. Parity is 1.00, where euro is the same value, if that's not even the right word, is the dollar. And then uh -huh. get to 0.99 would be ever weaker at euro. I try to do that in English because my Greek is... Can you, you know, see me in classics? <laughs> You're like, I when is this could. I could. Oh, and no, no, you couldn't. Classics <laughs> for me was Toronto or Montreal, which is better. Continue. In any case, I actually started on the FX here, desk here at Bloomberg, so I love this conversation. And Jeremy, one of my favorite things about FX is that it's a zero-sum game. It's pretty uh, cut and dry. And <clears throat> actually, Tom brought up Euro-Yen uh, about an hour ago, and it's just been trading sideways, really, for the last few months. So when we talk about a weaker Euro, when we talk about parity, how much of this is just a U.S. dollar story and that dominant U.S. dollar? Well, it is very much the dominant U.S. dollar because, of course, if you look at the dollar against sterling, you look against the, against the Australian or New Zealand dollars, clearly the dollar is gaining and remains uh, relatively resilient purely because of that uh, macro backdrop, which is uh, very different and uh, much more supportive than, that, than elsewhere. But there are specific euro factors which are still uh, remaining uh, on, the, uh, on, the, on the front foot. So we continue to see weakness in terms of those uh, flash PMIs uh, earlier in the period. So we uh, continue to see German manufacturing near a, a depression scenario than even a recession. So there are plenty of domestic headwinds which are uh, uh, dragging on the on the euro's valuation, but of course at the same time, when you're looking at the yen, you are also seeing that uh, differential in terms of the monetary policy standpoint playing out very uh, significantly as far as uh, the continued gains in dollar yen, which of course uh, really ra raised the spectre of uh, potential MOF action uh, it's, uh, as far as uh, dollar yen is concerned once again. And Jeremy, extend that conversation to what we're going to hear in just about three minutes from the European Central Bank. When you think about those domestic headwinds and the desire for the ECB to stay on hold, to keep rates high, how long can they possibly stay on hold before they eventually do have to cut? Well, I think the, the language in the statement will probably once again reference being sufficiently uh, uh, sufficiently long in duration. And I think that duration probably takes us into the middle of next year. I think the ECB staff forecast uh, in December will be hugely instrumental in terms of the policy narrative. But I think the ECB will be holding at this 4% threshold probably until the June meeting, the meetings when we have updated staff forecasts uh, at the end of each quarter or at the start of each quarter are particularly instrumental. So I think probably at June next year will be the key meeting if we are going to see inflation coming down, uh, providing a slightly more constructive backdrop for the ECB in terms of its policy narrative. Jeremy Stretcher, this was CIBC, uh, head of all of their foreign exchange effort here. Commercial th uh, free through the ECB decision. We'll see that here in two uh, minutes as well. Maria Tadeo is not in Frankfurt, in Athens today. I do like this idea that they travel around. Can you see, you know, the FOMC and, and Mr. Powell? In Dallas or with Mary Daly I would out love in San that. Francisco. That would be really cool. Going to different really diners good. and kind of go talk with well, people. With all the <clears> uncertainty <throat> in the world, isn't it nice to know right. they're always going to be? I, I took a, I took a, an emergency meeting. I had a phone call on a Saturday really? morning. <laughs> Can you go to the Greek, the consulate, rather? And I said, of course. And I threw on a tie and a bow, you know, bow tie and the whole thing. I show up at the Greek consulate in this Greek in crisis, and the prime minister was there at the time. And Greece was falling apart with 12% inflation. Spreads were out, blown out. Least stuff, Lisa, you know better uh, than me. And it was a very emotional discussion worldwide on a, on a Saturday. It was a beautiful autumnal day, as I can remember. And would I have known then the victory lap for Greece that mm. Lagarde confronts this morning? I don't think so. And that's maybe the symbolism of being in Athens. I'm sure Maria <clears throat> Tadeo will continue yeah. her European tour while she will uh, stand behind beautiful backdrops with her hair in the wind uh, and discuss uh, the latest. I will say Athens is going to be a fascinating place just because also <clears throat> it benefits from the weaker euro. Think yeah. about tourism. We've been talking about that and the incredible amount, particularly huge, yeah. the Greek islands, yeah. et cetera. How much <clears throat> has that bolstered the economy? And it's it's going to be interesting to see. Of course, all we're trying to do here in surveillance is trying to get a three island tour of Greece. I mean, I mean, let's be, Katie, you don't know the shtick here, but you know, this is where <laughs> Faraway's in and goes, I remember yeah. on roads. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, years it's a road ago. trip. And, and, you know, we'll have to see how that goes. Futures negative 31. Uh, dollar continued strength here. The euro 105. 540 is well. That is a weaker euro, and you heard Jeremy Stretzer speak of a tendency in his guesstimate to get from 105 down to 102. 
an exceptionally important day for the ECB. And here at 8.15 Wall Street time, a set of headlines will come out on the ECB. They leave their rates where they are. I mean, Farrell would be like apoplectic right now. I can't do the John <laughs> Farrell imitation, folks. I'm just not going to, I'm not even going to try to do it. It's the first place I saw John was on the lawn in Frankfurt. But there's the headlines. Yeah, we do have the news that ECB is leaving their <clears throat> deposit facility rate at 4%. This was the expectation. The estimate was 4%. The main financing rate at 4.5%, as expected. Uh, the ECB is saying that inflation is set to be too high for too long. And again, this is very Powell-esque that the, uh, uh, that the rate level must be sustained for a sufficiently long time. Inflation is still <clears throat> expected to stay too high, Tom, yeah. for too long. And what's interesting there is in one of the headlines flying by, 30 or so headlines, what Bloomberg does best, is the reaffirmation of getting to 2%. Now, I don't know if they, I would say for the euro, that's more like 2.0, 2.1%. For 2% for the U.S., is. Eh, maybe 2.6 or or whatever. But there's that reaffirmation that I heard from Lagarde at the IMF meeting. They don't want to make the same mistake that they made last time. And that's what we heard from Jeremy there. Stretch, and that's what we heard from others as well. There is a headline here. I'm going to do one more here before we go to Tadeo, who knows a little more than I do on this. ECB price outlook underlying dynamics Transmission are key, which is Jean-Claude Trichet at 101. In Athens, at the special meeting of the ECB before the Lagarde press conference, are Marie, Maria Tadeo. Maria, how difficult is it to transmit monetary policy across the fractured nations of Europe? Uh, well, Tom, it is difficult. And by the way, there is a reason as to why we're here in Athens. As you know uh, very well, the European Central Bank, every year they take one meeting away from Frankfurt and they rotate among the different euro area uh, members. Conveniently, this year was in Athens. Now, uh, as you say, they keep rates unchanged, but I would also even go deeper into the statement uh, to answer your question. What they also say is that the PEP reinvestment, remember, there's a lot of debate as to whether they would try to accelerate uh, that and bring it to an end before they say and repeat it will continue until the end uh, of 2024. What they also say, Tom, which is interesting, is that the rate level must be maintained at this uh, level sufficiently long time. So the way that I read this is this is now a central bank that's switching to the higher for longer. Remember, a lot of people have their belief, once they hold, you hold, and the conversation will turn into just how long do you want to keep them uh, where they are. But to answer your question, yes, it is difficult uh, because we are seeing uh, PMIs across the euro area uh, showing an economy that cannot take a breather. But what is unusual here is that it is the German economy in this case that is suffering the most. That is a different narrative to the one that you would expect in a country like Athens or Greece, which just got upgraded to investment grades. So to some extent, the table's turning as a result of, well, many issues, but also predominantly the war and the energy crisis. What we're seeing in the market is not a significant reaction one way or another. A little bit of yields coming in on the euro region bonds. You are seeing uh, the euro just is still lower on the dollar, but just fluctuating around. Maria, what is the challenge now for Christine Lagarde, now that it seems like she's following a very Powell-like speech um, in terms of the roadmap here, what is her challenge in communicating this to a lot of people who have a lot of questions about what sufficiently restrictive means uh, and also what kind of fissures in the financial system could make them turn around? Yes, and also we should note uh, this decision does not come in isolation. Remember, we had uh, the PMI data, that lending survey also from the ECB, and then the geopolitics yesterday. Uh, to answer your question, we already had a preview from the head of the ECB. She gave an interview to a Greek uh, TV station in which she said we're not there yet on inflation, but we are improving in our battle to tame it, but nonetheless keeping a close eye to the geopolitics. She also suggested the ramifications, and that is assuming you keep a contained uh, conflict between Israel and Hamas will have ramifications and an impact on the energy. So obviously they are keeping an eye uh, on that. So today, from what we see in the statement, the message from the European Central Bank is on hold, unchanged. I'll be interested to see what is the rationale behind it. That pebble investment doesn't really change. And then she sticks with this message. Inflation is still way too high. So again, switching uh, from higher for longer. From what I see, this is still on ECB. Frankly, that is pretty dovish.
And Maria, we were just talking to Jeremy Stretch, and he made the point that he's looking at June of next year as the key meeting. And when you look at the next seven, eight months for the ECB and the Eurozone economy, the Eurozone inflation picture, what does the trajectory look like there? Look, it's a good point that you mentioned also uh, Italian BTPs because, again, some of the, well, the argument to perhaps uh, accelerate the ending of the PEP program uh, reinvestment uh, uh. would precipitate or some believed could trigger uh, u in, in the bond market. So, again, obviously they have to, uh. once again, balance out the many implications. To me, it'll be interesting how she pushes back or not on this idea of cuts because, remember, up until now she's not been willing to put a number on the peak rates, but they definitely did not want to precipitate the debate around cuts. She doesn't want to go there. She doesn't want right. to, again, accelerate the market to go into that conversation now. Maria, thank you so much from Athens. It's a wonderful thing. I wish the Federal Reserve System would do this as well. Just brilliant. One meeting a year away from Washington would be good for everyone involved. Maria Tadeo in Athens. We continue with Jeremy Stretch of CIBC as he considers these headlines. Not much movement in the market. I've got Euro 10540. Jeremy, a key question to me is simple, and that is the idea of what 2% means. These are different economies, different nations. Do you look at it as 2.0%? Is the ECB Bundesbank hope 2.2% while the Fed's 2% is 2.8%? Well, of course, the, the Eurozone is a, is a difficult beast to manage, and I think uh, President Lagarde is very mindful of that because, as, as we've touched upon, there is a very different uh, degree of uh, performance and activity in a number of the different economies um, across the zone. Now, the Eurozone and the ECB is aiming to get back uh, inflation to that 2% uh, target threshold over the medium term. I think it was notable that, obviously, inflation in September did fall a little faster than the ECB had been expecting. And as I say, I think the, the next meeting in December will proved to be particularly instructive as we get forecast out to 2026 uh, for the first time, but also looking at those longer run inflation expectations. And if those are back towards right. the 2% threshold uh, in aggregate across the, across the whole of the zone. And that, of course, is the difficulty. We right. will still get divergence in the individual nations, but as an aggregate measure, the ECB is going to be aiming to get back to that 2% yeah. target threshold over the course of the uh, next two years. Jeremy, I'm going to go to a wonderful moment I had with the August engineer from Lyon, Jean-Claude Trichet. And he talked to me about transmission, the diffusement of an economy across borders. Europe doesn't have the transmission mechanisms of America, do they? Well, there is obviously one of the inadequacies of the Eurozone project is the, uh, you know, the difficulties on the fiscal side on a relative basis that uh, the U.S. obviously has because the U.S. has uh, the, you know, the federal system and we do get uh, that uh, uh, disbursement of federal funds across the fiscal dynamics. So we are in a situation where the, the, the plumbing, if you like, in terms of the Eurozone economy, in terms of monetary and fiscal policy is very diverse because, of course, fiscal dynamics are still much more at the behest of national governments. But I think the other interesting dynamic to consider as we move into 2024 is that the Eurozone is thinking about bringing back those fiscal thresholds that were put on uh, or suspended right. during the COVID period. And that will be an interesting dynamic to add to the wrinkle about fragmentation risk. And that, of course, is one of the big concerns that the ECB has to be mindful of, even if uh, President Lagarde will try and downplay any concerns at this particular point. Jeremy Stretch, thank you so much. Your support to stay with us after this ECB announcement. He will prepare with CIBC for the Lagarde uh, uh, press conference. I, I look, Lisa, at where we are. We're going to go to Mike McKee here on data. And, you know, I'm sorry, I'm going to switch now to the American economy because I don't think enough has been said about how wrong Tom Keene was. Claims in six minutes. It's not the jobs report. I was lectured on this earlier. But this is maybe the most botched GDP call I've ever done. McKee will set us straight. The GDP call in terms of outperforming, and no one expected a reacceleration. And this does have to do with the labor market, the fact that you have seen strength and unemployment claims come in uh, below 200,000 for several weeks. And now all of a sudden, we're just expecting 200,000 again, 207,000. All of this goes to a question. 
Is this consistent with getting inflation back down to 2% in the U.S.? We just heard the same kind of tone, higher for longer, from Christine Lagarde. Mm. Is it going to work in the U.S. at the level that we currently have? Well, if you think about what we're expecting out of GDP in, what, six minutes, a lot of that rebound that we're seeing, that resurgence, is expected to be driven by the U.S. consumer. U.S. consumers are still spending it out there. You marry that together with what the labor picture looks like. People still have jobs. The labor market is still growing. And and people are spending. And this is different than the US than, than <laughs> Europe. Did you see Mercedes? <laughs> Yeah. Did you see those earnings that were interesting? They basically said people are pushing back. Even the luxury buyers are feeling inflation where it is right now. And it is crimping sales. It's just where it is. And again, I'm going to go to Torsten Slack with his message here uh, this morning. I'm sorry, this super core, which I don't understand. Only McKee understands it. He's got the incense burning at his desk. And he's figured it's like Game of Thrones. You know, it is written. Super core inflation is 4%. You know, that's all there is to it. How much of a comfort is that, though? Because you made the point when you're at the grocery store, you see prices going up. That is felt inflation. I don't know if that's captured in Super Bowl. I think it's two parts. I'm in the camp. It's two parts of America. I'm in the John Edwards camp. It's two Americas. There's a narrow slice of America prospering, and everybody else is absolutely hammered. We are going to go to key, I mean key economic data here, always with the leadership of Michael McKee. And then Lindsay Piegza will join us, chief economist, Steve Fall. An eventful Thursday, Bloomberg surveillance. surveillance from New York on an important Thursday. A number of narratives out there, including futures at negative 28. The VIX ought a stick of tension. Foreign exchange speaks volumes in the bond market is what it is and what it's doing to our financial system. 30-year bank rate mortgage out to 8.09%. It is time for American economic data, 15 minutes before Oligarch a uh, presser, numbers coming up quickly, and Michael McKee has the envelope. Michael, what do you see? Well, the winner is GDP, the U.S., posting a 4.9% growth rate in the third quarter. That is a little bit lower than the Atlanta Fed, but certainly higher than the consensus of Bloomberg uh, Economist survey, which was 4.5%. Katie Greifeld has been out spending money. <laughs> Consumer spending goes up 4% during the quarter after an eight-tenths rise the uh, prior quarter. We'll get the um, latest updated numbers in just a second, but there's a lot of data to run through here. So uh, jobless claims, 210,000. That's up from uh, revised 200,000. That 198 went away, but uh, we're still very, very low there. Continuing claims, 1,790,000. That's up by about 70,000 from the month before. Trade, uh, the uh, trade deficit is at $85.8 billion. That is up a little bit from 84.6. That will uh, be a bit of a subtraction from the GDP numbers. And then uh, durable goods orders coming out this morning for the month of September. Their preliminary number up 4.7% a major increase in business investment. Uh, that's after a tenth of a percent decline uh, the prior month. <clears throat> the capital goods orders, non-defense, X-Air, the proxy for business spending up six-tenths. That's a little bit lower than the 1.1 percent we saw a month before. So I would imagine that the markets are trying to react to all of this. And Tom yeah. and Lisa will have that. And let me look into what the latest right. numbers uh, for the GDP breakdown are. If there's any number of ways to look at this, folks, and the answer is really a quiescent market response. I think it's too much data too quickly, as Michael Key mentions, and of course with durable goods, which maybe is a second tier statistic today, but it's a jump condition to a buoyant American uh, economy. On dollar, I'm pretty much unchanged. Futures a little bit better, more constructive, negative 25 standard and poor's. VIX comes in a little bit. The Bramo cam signifies a bewildered Lisa <laughs> Bramowitz, I, 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 I say. Yen was still 150, and in the bond market, Lisa, I don't have a clue what to say about the bond market. 
I honestly can't really understand it. You see yields lower across the board uh, on the margins, not massive moves, but this was a pretty big beat on GDP. It was expected to be a beat. Anna Wong over in Bloomberg Economics Looks nailed like a it. Genius, yeah. uh, you saw also just the GDP price index come in at three and a half percent versus the two point seven percent expectation. Durable goods orders, everything came in above expectations, indicating strength except for one area. A marginal increase, bigger than expected jump in initial jobless claims by not very much, 3,000, mm -hmm. but continuing claims, they rose more substantially to 1.79 yeah. million. So are we looking at <clears throat> sort of trying to parse through any sense right. of weakness? I don't understand what else it could be. And one thing I do here, completely amateur, Lindsay Piegza would never do this, and Michael McKee would, would swat me with his Denver Broncos paddle. And the answer here is I got a 4.9% GDP, and I'm going to add to that the GDP price index, and I'm simplistically going to say my nominal GDP to hedge it is above 8%. No one called that, say, in March last year. Katie, before we go to Mike McKee, your observation. I'm with Lisa. I mean, you take a look at the bond market right now. You take a look at two-year yields. They hit a session high and then immediately dropped, removing lower on the yields front. If you're looking for stability, maybe you're going to find it in futures. But yeah. maybe it is what we're seeing in initial jobless claims, the fact that maybe we're starting to see some weakness around the edges. Of course, when you have two huge reports come out at the same time, one has to win out, and maybe that's the winner. Yeah, I'm going gonna, gonna, gonna to look at this when we welcome all of you on radio and television to a little bit of a spike in terms of improving Standard & Poor's 500. Uh, negative 30 at one point on the Standard & Poor's futures, now negative uh, 17. I'm watching the VIX carefully. It gives away. It's not in, it's not, it doesn't have the fear, rather, of one big figure point. We've come in. So it's a more quiescent market, Lisa Abramowitz. A viewer wrote in, thank you very much, I appreciate it, that <clears throat> core PCE was 2.4% down from 3.7% quarter over quarter. So another reason maybe for a feeling yeah, that okay. we're seeing that disinflation continue. Michael McKee looking at 47 pages of data. Michael, what does page 42 say? <laughs> Page 42 says that businesses didn't spend as much money as perhaps we thought they might. That seems to be one of the most interesting sub-data points here. Uh, Non-residential fixed investment down a tenth of a percent. It was up 7.4 percent in the second quarter. And so uh, that is a, a major drop-off, and I don't know the explanation for that other than equipment fell 3.8 percent. Uh, we did see structures continue to rise 1.6 percent. A lot of talk about all the buildings going up for the factories that are reshoring and uh, things like that. Goods uh, purchases were up 4.8% going back to that 4% gain in personal consumption and services up 3.6%. So pretty evenly divided, but the story yeah. that people were switching from right. goods to services not quite there. Uh, the uh, change in inventories 80 billion uh, right. point six, uh, up from 14.9. Yeah. So uh, a major change there yeah. that also adds to growth. I'm not as sold on the uh, PCE numbers, Tom, because they are quarterly average. Uh, uh, tomorrow we will get the right. latest PCE inflation numbers, and the Fed is going to pay much more attention to that. But it is yeah. good news to see it start to drop. Uh, well, Mike Bramo wants to jump in here. But I, got, I got one key question here. How much does that 4.9% statistic vary with the second look and the third look of GDP? Well, it will vary more uh, at the second look because we'll get uh, more precise data. And as we just noted, we got some uh, trade data that would uh, take away a little bit. But we'll get some more updated consumer spending numbers. By the third uh, revision, you don't get a whole lot of change. So uh, look for the next one. But at 4.9 uh, percent, it isn't going to change significantly. Larry Meyer, the old Fed governor, said that uh, his rule was that if there is a surprise, the revision goes goes in the direction of the surprise, not the other way. One thing that is sort of being overshadowed in all of these results is that uh, that the ongoing continuing claims, jobless claims, rose somewhat substantially. How much do you pay attention to that as a metric of weakening around the margins in the labor market? 
Well, it's, uh, because it's claims, it's a little hard to know uh, exactly what it means for the labor market because it, it, it does mean that those who uh, did not get jobs have taken a little bit longer to be re-employed. But you've got to combine that with the <coughs> length of time on unemployment that will come in the jobs report next week to see if there is a real slowdown. But it is, as you point out, uh, <coughs> it's uh, right. interesting, perhaps canary, if that trend continues. Mark is starting to move on this. Michael Keith, thank you so much for complete coverage here. As we go to Lagarde here in about 12 uh, minutes to review, futures improved negative 30, negative 25, now negative 18 on the standard and poor's futures down four tenths of a percent. The VIX comes in with a vengeance. We are almost near 22 now at 21.06. In the yield space, Lisa, help me here. I still got some curve disinversion, but the real yield comes in. What do you see in full faith and credit? I mean, it, well, we'll find out during the day. It's not sort of priced in the same kind of real time uh, when it comes to a corporate credit in real uh, full faith and credit. To me, the fact that you're not seeing a pop in yields on right. the fastest pace of quarterly growth in the U.S. going back two years, to me, right. is somewhat surprising. October 30, Apple to announce new MacBook, Pro, MacBook Pros, I should say. Lindsay Piegs is pleased with that because as she ran her Excel spreadsheet on the American economy, it burned up her MacBook a couple days ago. Dr. Piegs joins us now from Stiefel as well. How hard is it to put together an Excel spreadsheet with the mysteries of this American economy? Well, it's typically difficult, but it's become increasingly difficult with all of these ancillary factors that are coming in that are virtually impossible to model. We do have a lot of international factors that are impacting uh, the market's expectations. We do have now unprecedented fiscal variables that we're trying to uh, account for. But I think right now the market is very much discounting that third quarter number, focusing instead uh, on the latest central bank decisions, the BOC, the ECB as a proxy for what to expect from the Fed next week, suggesting that developed central banks around the world, despite still elevated inflation, are starting to pull back in anticipation of a slower level of longer-term growth. So the market very much anticipating the Fed may be moving to the sideline for certainly a prolonged period of time, but maybe indefinitely at this point. So, Lindsay, just to crystallize what you're saying, are you saying that the Fed can kind of look through what we're getting out of this blowout GDP print, or at least that's the market's expectation? No, that's the market's expectation. But remember, the market has been preemptively calling an end to Fed rate hikes for the past two years and uh, wrongly pricing in rate cuts. The Fed, however, has been very clear, beating that drum of higher for longer, very consistent in their message. And I think when we look at some of the underlying data in the Q3 report, the resilience of businesses, the resilience of the consumer. And yes, to Lisa's point, we have seen a little bit of an uptick in claims, particularly continuing claims. But broadly speaking, the labor market is still extremely tight. So the Fed is looking at all of these data juxtaposed with inflation that's still too high. I think the committee is going to have a very difficult time selling a prolonged period of a pause. I think there is still more work to be done before they reach a sufficiently restrictive level to ensure that we remain on a disinflationary trend back to 2%. Well, Lindsay, you're getting at what I've been wondering about. Of course, this is a very uh, binary question, and we live in a shades of gray world. But when you think about the just raft of numbers that we got this morning, you take a look at the blowout GDP print, but then you look at initial jobless claims a little bit higher. What's the stronger signal there? Which one should we be focusing on? Oh, the, the consumer, certainly. And, and I understand that this is backward looking. But remember, claims are extremely volatile. And we don't want to look at one data point, but rather the underlying trend in claims, which is still extremely low, still signaling that tight labor market or tight labor market conditions, which is going to continue to perpetuate the ability for upward pressure on wages, extending that to further purchasing power for the consumer in the marketplace, suggesting, again, the, the backbone of the economy, the underlying support of the economy, i.e. the consumer remains resilient. There's been a real angst to underpinning some of the recent sell-off in the bond market at the longer end that hasn't been tied to the Fed at all. It's been tied to a widening deficit and likely increasing spending. How much is the Fed going to find itself increasingly at odds with fiscal spending? Because you talk about the need potentially for the Fed to do more. How much is the strength that we're seeing in the GDP preprint tied directly to that government spending? 
Oh, absolutely. This is one of the problems. When monetary policy and fiscal policy are moving in opposite directions, that's going to force the Fed's hand to take an even firmer position to counteract that expansion of government uh, outlays. Now, we do know that federal stimulus has largely concluded, but there's other fiscal stimulus that's coming down the pipeline as a result of legislation that was passed over the last 12 to 18 months, be that infrastructure spending, the IRA, the CHIPS Act, and other spatterings of state and local stimulus that is still still being spent on constituents. So uh, there is still a lot of purchasing power, a lot of borrowing and, and investment power out in the marketplace that the Fed is desperately trying to drain out of the system. But again, the more that we see monetary and fiscal policy moving in opposite directions, the more that becomes a barrier for the Fed to achieve its goal of price stability. Lindsay, a lot of people are writing in. They're saying that uh, I didn't really have a right to be confused because it's core PCE. And when you look at the actual inflation, yes, you're seeing growth, but it is disinflationary. You are seeing a reduced pace of growth when you look, strip out energy and food. How much credence do you give the idea that we got in this GDP preprint uh, a core PCE read of 2.4 percent? Is that the sort of number to hinge off? It's certainly encouraging, but again, when we look at some of the other data metrics, when we look at headline PCE, when we look at the headline CPI, we're not seeing this clear downward trend of disinflation. Now, of course, monetary policy is not based on headline price pressures. We strip out those volatile food and energy components. Uh, looks like yeah, we got some technical be. difficulties there. It's a buoyant American economy, bringing the lines down. Lindsay Piega is stiff, well, very near her good conversation with us here on a stunning American economy. There's a Hall of Fame of where I've been wrong. I guess my GDP call for 2023 isn't in it, but it's an honorable mention. <laughs> I mean, I don't care else. what the revision is, 4.9 percent. I, I mean, that's nuts. I mean, it's it goes nuts. back, though, to even if you knew all these numbers, how would you invest in this market? Because it is surprising. I mean, to see two-year Treasury yields down on a 4.9 percent GDP print, I know that you're getting some grief. But I agree with you. It's confusing. I know we got a raft of data, but just focusing okay. on that headline, how let's do you go, Let's it? go. Oh, UPS, it really wasn't that good. Southwest Air, all the rest. Of this, it's just really sort of difficult out there. Yeah. 4.9 percent well, GDP. They're pockets of weakness and then they're pockets of strength, right? And this is yeah, sort of the Microsoft. difficulty. Well, this is the difficulty exactly. It's called Microsoft. Even though you know you saw the disappointment in the shares, it's called Google. It's called what we saw uh, with yeah. Meta. At what point does that average out into something that's disinflation, uh, air, disinflationary yeah. while still being expansionary? Because that's the soft landing that everybody was hinging their hats. Yeah. And that seems to be a little bit of the story that was painted by today's data. Greifeld with best insight today on Bloomberg Surveillance. You failed. I failed. <laughs> Greifeld nailed it by looking at the NASDAQ. Year to date, the Dow Jones Industrial Average flat. Mm. SPX up a solid 9%. It's October. You know, we're making money. NASDAQ up 23%. Year, this is the composite, folks. This isn't the 100 beauty stocks as well. I mean, just amazing. It is amazing. And I mean, that's a unique feature of the American economy, of the right. American stock market. It was a big weight last year, of course, but here we are. Right now, and, and thank you to all of our guests today. Uh, we're, we're not going to, it's a photo opportunity for Christine Lagarde. She's the president of the European Central Bank. It was a joy to speak to her here at the IMF meetings. I think it was 10 days ago. And she has a full plate in front of her at their meetings in Athens, Greece today. Uh, Worthy's on stage with her, for those of you on Bloomberg at radio. It's a portable podium today hmm. for, for the people out at Frankfurt. But uh, with different Worthy's, I think we're going to get introductions started here. Uh, let's stay with Lisa and Katie uh, as we wait for introductions, and we'll be abrupt when Christine Lagarde comes in. What's she going to say, Lisa? I think she's going to say sufficiently restrictive. I think she's going to say we'll have to see what the data shows us, but we are committed to getting inflation down to 2%, uh, that yeah. they're going to stay the course, that they didn't raise rates this year this time but that they are open to doing it further the inflation still remains too high next question please what's it like when they visit the bundesbank do they go to 1.9 percent <laughs> yeah, exactly it's it's bleak it's bleak i mean it's maybe they take a longer lunch i mean the, an the answer here uh moving from frankfurt to the bundesbank is is a more strident tone of core europe who are really upset about six percent 
inflation here or there. It's all been flipped on its head, right? I mean, the, the sort of German economy was the strong one, and Greece was the weak one, and now they're in Athens, which is one of the bright spots in an otherwise yeah. troubled picture. We like to digress here in surveillance. Javier Blas has been really good, not about petroleum, Brent crude, and West Texas Intermediate, but the game change across Greece's Mediterranean of the price of olive oil. Hmm. It is a true moonshot. What's the I, I guess ticker climate change. on that? How do I try that? There's a, there's a ticker. It's like Bloss Index. I don't know what it is. <laughs> but, there is but a... you know, the agriculture region here, and this is the climate change debate, and we really felt it in Marrakesh of coming north here into Spain and across over to Greece and then, of course, over to the shores of Turkey as well. Wolfgang Prossel here, Lagarde's, uh, and here is the president of the European Central Bank, Christine Lagarde, still making introductions.